here come the Beavs, and they are the only team from a Power 5 conference to have the luxury of playing four of their final regular season games at home. It remains to be seen whether they can ride that home field advantage into the postseason. So we're here at Reeser Stadium, and we go down to the field to check in with the third member of our broadcast team. Thank you very much, Drea. His team will start on defense. They will kick it off to Sonny Dykes and the Golden Bears, much like Oregon State. They're looking to reverse their fortunes here in the month of November. Trevor Romain to boot it away to Kalfani Muhammad. Back for Cal. Trey Watson as well. Underway at Reeser. And it's Watson mishandling. Muhammad picks it up. He's working with a cast on that left hand where he still has a broken thumb. He's out across the 20. And we start with our AXA difference makers with the Golden Bears on offense, Anthony Harris. And when Cal is on offense, Daniel Lasko really has to be a big part of this offense. Running the football, keeping some balance. Luke Rebenzer, who they like to sub in at the quarterback position, will be key using those legs. Dylan Wynn for the Beavs on the defensive side of the football has to pressure the pocket. And D.J. Alexander, I think we'll see them use that outside linebacker to add him to the rush. Jared Goff, the sophomore, ranks among the nation's top ten in seven different categories. He feels the heat on first down. Gets it away intended for Maurice Harris. He's without Trevor Davis and Kenny Lawler, two of his top receivers tonight. Just love the way that Jared Goff in his sophomore season has enhanced his calm. You know, in, in a way that as he started as a true freshman last year, the physical tools were apparent, but you could see the game just got too big for him at times. Unable to finish last year's contest against OSU, but the Beavers' defensive coordinator says that he is clearly Cal's most improved player. Daniel Lasco has been very good as well. A reliable receiver out of the backfield, but he drops his first attempt. And he's got some all-purpose abilities. He's done an excellent job running the football throughout the season, but I think Oregon State's going to have to make sure they try to force Cal to be as one-dimensional as possible, and that's what Mark Banker talked to us about this week. He called the performance at Stanford tentative and disappointing. They can get off the field three and out here. Goff climbs the pocket, sets his feet. Good for first down yardage. Steven Anderson moves the chains. You watch Goff as you reference there, JB. Climb the pocket because there's bodies around him, but he stays calm and keeps a good platform. It's not a pretty pass as he leaves his hand, but that's what you have to do as a quarterback. Don't leave the pocket too early. Climb into the pocket and deliver a nice ball. Thought about Lasko, instead pulled it out, went right back to Steven Anderson, who Tony Franklin, the offensive coordinator, called the heartbeat of our offense. 6'3", 215. Anderson, a former walk-on. Guy who's really continued to excel with this football team. And you can see the confidence of Steven Anderson has grown as well. So Goff and the Bears already in the Beavers' territory. Here's the first carry for Lasco. He's coming off a career performance. Tiptoes the sideline, shoved out right at the 30, but a flag down. Steven Nelson escorted him out of bounds. Holding, number three of the offense. Ten-yard penalty. First down will be repeated. At the wide receiver position, you're going to be asked to block quite a bit in this Bears offense. All the little slip screens they do and now routes, bubble routes. They like to get the ball outside the numbers, and as they do, it's called upon for the wide receivers to block, try to stop block the defensive backs there. Cal is last in the Pac-12 in terms of penalty yardage. OSU last by sheer number of penalties, so we could see a lot of yellow on the field tonight. There's the first flag, and a power set by the Bears. Goff has Harper way behind the defense, but he overshot his man. That look says it all. It was a missed opportunity. They put Jordan Rigsby into the backfield at the fullback position, so the defense is expecting it to be a lead play there to the field side. Nice play action look, and then Goff, he's got Harper wide open behind the defense. Misses him right there. And Chris Harper's got some jets. Difficult to overthrow, but when you're as strong as Jared Goff, you can overthrow most anyone. 
So back to four wide on second down. And he gets it out so quickly behind Bryce Treggs there, but OSU's going to have a tough time getting to golf. But some of the things you try to accomplish at times is even when you know you're not going to sack the quarterback, just to try to keep him uncomfortable, keep him off balance in the pocket. And Mark Banker talked to us about wanting to bring pressure at opportunistic moments, even if he knew there wasn't going to be a sack, but just find those moments where they thought they could at least pressure the passer. One of the biggest improvements year to year for Cal is on third down. They've already picked up one third and long. Here's another. Goff rolling to his right. A flag down. He ran into DJ Alexander. We'll see if the play stands. Terry Layden leads our crew. Holding number 40 of the defense, 10 yard penalty, results in a first down. As I saw it during the play, I really didn't think Michael Doctor held Daniel Lasko out. Lasko, as he came out of the backfield, it's one of those situations as a defender where once the quarterback leaves the pocket, you almost start to stalk block the guy you're covering because Lasko didn't really leave the backfield with some urgency and try to continue his route up the field. Here's that formation again with Jordan Rigsby in the backfield. And Vic and Wary, the tailback. Goff again wants Harper. This time the coverage much better. Steven Nelson with him step for step. I believe that was an overthrow on purpose from Jared Goff because he saw the double coverage down there, came off the play action again as we saw just a couple of snaps ago. But well defended there by the Beeb secondary. Didn't have the opportunity to throw to an open Chris Harper, so he just overthrew him, which he had practice with just about three plays ago. And where he stays in the game, second down and 10 to the near sideline, Maurice Harris. Ran out of bounds by Steven Nelson, but that pass uncatchable, and so no flat. A chilly night here, the quarterback position. I was curious to see whether or not Jared Goff would come out with a glove on his throwing hand, because in inclement weather at points last season, we did see him wearing a glove. Not doing it tonight, no rain here in Corvallis this evening, just the colder conditions. It can make the football difficult to grip for the QB, though. Best crowd of the year tonight at Reeser as they get a Saturday night league game to begin the month of November. Third down, the full 10. Goff. That looked designed, and it's blown dead with a flag down on the far sideline. Tyreek Zimmerman made the tackle. Before the snap. Ball start number 64 of the offense five-yard penalty third down you can tell that was one of those plays that's a part of the initial script here getting through the first 15 to 20 plays of the game I actually like the call even though Jared Goff obviously not the most nimble of foot quarterback in the Pac-12 certainly not even on his own team as they like to work in Luke Rebenzer for those situations to try and use his legs to hurt defenses but since it's unexpected you think there's an opportunity to have that come open on a third down scenario but well defended it takes Cal way out of field goal range. They need the 22 of OSU for a first down. Please Correct the clock to read. The game clock will start on the snap. So third down and 15 on the opening drive for Sonny Dykes and Cal. Goff goes short. Back to the original line of scrimmage. Third catch for Steven Anderson. Justin Strong making the sub. Give Justin Strong, the redshirt freshman, the tackle at safety. Cal will attempt a field goal. They get James Langford on the field. Bryce McGovern, the senior, handles the holding duties. Langford's long is 47. This would be from 50. Timeout OSU. So Cal's opening drive stalls out on third down and long. They'll try to come away with three when we come back to research. Opening drive for the Cal Golden Bears on the road here in Corvallis. 
And it would be a career-long field goal for James Langford. Officially a 49-yard attempt. No good. So Langford has been perfect inside of 40 yards this season, but a bit beyond his range. Cal comes up empty on its opening possession. So we take you to Anthony's keys to the game. They're brought to you by Mitsubishi Motors, who invites you to find your own lane. And that kick from Langford that was missed there didn't allow Cal to start fast offensively. They've been outscored by every Pac-12 opponent they've had so far this season in the first quarter except one. They've got to manufacture pressure on the defensive side of the football because their sack total this season so far has been atrocious 11th in the Pac-12. Goff had Harper for a surefire touchdown two steps beyond the defensive back and miss that cost Cal seven points on the opening drive. Here's Sean Manning who begins tonight needing 194 yards to supplant Matt Barkley as the Pac-12's all-time leading passer. Anthony, your axe of difference makers. At the center position for the Beavers, Josh Mitchell has to have a big night because he really struggled last week against that Stanford defensive front. Connor Hamlet at the tight end position. I need a big game from the tight end position tonight. And Hardy Nickerson defensively for Cal. The linebacker's been getting better and better week after week this season. Stephen McClure, I think it's a safety position, has so much potential to have a huge game tonight, running the alley, filling the lanes on run plays. On second down, they go to the ground. And a pickup of four. Teron Ward gets another start tonight. Cameron Walker credited with the tackle. We do expect to see Storm Woods back in the Beavers' backfield. Almost played at Stanford last week despite a knee injury. They say he's close to 100%, but Ward gets the starting nod. Adds that depth in the backfield at the tailback position that I've been calling for Oregon State to use more and more throughout the season, leaning on the run game to set up the pass and take some pressure off of Sean Mannion. On third down, they're among the worst in FBS. They're going to throw behind the sticks and hope that Ward can break a couple of tackles. He's chased out shy of the 40. Walker again holding the edge, and OSU looks to have gone three and out on their opening touch. A fairly quick three and out there as well. Cal defense really needs to feel good about that. Starting the game off with a three and out, being in position with run plays, pass plays. Being threatened outside the numbers, tackling out in space. So Keith Costell to punt. He and Cole Leininger, his counterpart, were both named Ray Guy Award candidates. This week, Chris Harper, fair catch for Cal, and he'll give it back to Goff just inside the Golden Bears 30. Both teams come up empty on their opening trip. Back in Corvallis, the 67th meeting in the series between Cal and OSU. It dates all the way back to 1905. The Beavs have won a couple straight. We are scoreless after both teams touch the football on their opening drive. Jared Goff and the Golden Bears back to work. They start from just inside their own 30. Goff was three of nine on that opening drive. They stick it on the ground with Lasco. And he gets five. Anthony, did you observe the missing talented receivers from Cal in that opening possession? Well, they've got so much depth at the position that not having Kenny Lawler in the lineup, Trevor Davis, it certainly makes a difference for the, the comfort level of Jared Goff, I believe. But when you've got the expanded catch radius that a lot of these guys possess, even if you don't trust them to be completely open, I think there's still going to be some confidence to try to deliver it into some tight windows. Again on the ground, this is Kalfani Muhammad. He's across midfield. DJ Alexander wrapped him up, but not before a huge gash. A high school track champion is Muhammad, and they really haven't gotten in the ball as much as they'd like to through this point in the season because of that cast you see on the left hand. But he's carrying it in the right arm, which happens to be the outside hand towards the side that Kalfani Muhammad is running to. 23 yards on that pickup after just one carry for one yard last week against Oregon. What a swing that was from Goff as the pressure arrived from Ciala Houtau. And DJ Alexander. See the pocket break down here, but the ability to come backside just kind of flips it out there with his left arm, but still 
able to get enough momentum on the ball, enough accuracy fitting it in there to Steven Anderson. As you can see, Goff to the sideline. In comes Luke Rubenzer, the freshman, who they call their changeup, to use a baseball analogy. And they want to throw him more, even though he's a talented runner. It looked like that was his intention. And he was forced out right at the original line of scrimmage. Dylan Wynn gets the tackle. In the initial games that Rubenzer got into the lineup, you pretty much knew snap after snap that he was going to be a runner with the football and now especially in last week's game against the Ducks we saw them give him extended playing time allowed him to throw the football more and they really feel like he's got an extremely talented throwing arm but he's another true freshman who's playing and so they just haven't really tried to feature him in that role yet. Goff and the Bears got one of two third downs they also picked one up via penalty on their opening possession. Initial read not open. He extends the play and finds Steven Anderson. That's been his favorite target, but it's incomplete as he hit the turf out of bounds. It was an outstanding grab from Anderson. He's had a huge first quarter, but as he goes airborne for the football, we see Jared Goff being chased out of the pocket here. Throws the pass, and the momentum of Anderson takes him out of bounds. That hip, the right side of the hip, may have just grazed inbounds, but I think the left side of the hip came down out of bounds before anything else. Every play, of course, reviewed upstairs, and Cal's not in any hurry here right. as they have kept <laughs> the offense on the field for fourth down and eight, almost encouraging the replay booth to take another look. That's what you see where Sonny Dykes and Tony Franklin, they're waiting, wanting the review to take place. Anderson does make a clean catch. He comes down, and if the elbow is what hit first, no, it's his right toe. Watch his this right toe. Be a great look at it. See the pressure there. The Obum Blotchum. Now a flag has been thrown for delay of game. Didn't see offense. Five yard penalty. I think Sonny Dykes Four is down. almost taking that to prove his point. Why is this not being reviewed? And from a field position standpoint, if you are going to punt here on fourth down, it doesn't hurt you too much because you're just hoping to give your punter a little bit of extra space. And so with Oregon State declining the delay of game penalty, you don't get that extra space for the punt team. Of course, if Sonny was adamant, he could call a timeout and challenge it himself at his own risk. But if OHU is going to decline the penalty, then Jared Goff and the offense will go for it. It's actually fourth down and eight after the penalty was declined. They need the 32, and there's a pooch punt from the quarterback. Very Siler Miles esque. Not the result that Goff and Cal wanted. Well, while the action of the game itself was not stopped by the officials, the review didn't need to take place. Let's take a look at the UPS Road to the Pac 12 Championship with Washington, USC, and Oregon already winners today across the league. Road teams two and one, adding to the dominance so far in the Pac-12 for the teams playing their away games. Big storylines today, like Washington State QB Connor Halliday experiencing a broken leg in that contest against USC. Very unfortunate for the Cougs. Sean Mannion gets his second drive, and there is Storm Woods returning to the OSU backfield. Michael Rowe, a fifth-year senior safety, eventually drags him down after a gain of nine. Waiting for Storm Woods to get back into the lineup, add to that rushing attack, to reference the depth they have in the backfield, and you know, talk to Mike Riley about it just yesterday about the, you know, what I feel like is maybe not using that tailback position in the tight end position as frequently as you might like to, and he didn't disagree. <laughs> he said he wants to get the running game going more consistently as well. Now Full this, start. I assure you, Number is 10. a topic we of drilled the with the coaching staff, penalty. and they have drilled Still with their down. players. The pre-snap penalties, especially from the tight end position, it was Caleb Smith, but he and Hamlet both had one early against Stanford last week. And they felt like it was something that they got corrected earlier in the season as we spoke to John Garrett, the offensive coordinator, had a few, a few yips in the initial games, and then they went a while without it. But now we've seen the last couple of weeks getting back to these pre-snap penalties. So it's Woods again after we saw Teron Ward on the opening drive. That'll leave third and three for the Bees. Good to see Hardy Nickerson into the starting lineup for Cal. The staff brought him 
along slowly as he recovered from that foot injury suffered against USC last year. He's not a big linebacker, but certainly an active football player. They've been surprised how quickly Hardy Nickerson has come along and been able to play at a high level after suffering that foot injury and experiencing the, the offseason he's had to go through with rehab to get back to this point. Cal defense is without Brennan Scarlett and Avery Sebastian tonight. They pitch it to Woods. He needs a 30 yard line and he is not going to get there. Good pursuit to the football by the Golden Bears. Cal showed presence in the A gaps and Michael Barton even in the B gap. But watch the sideline to sideline pursuit of Hardy Nickerson just working laterally through the box. And then all the rest of the teammates in those white jerseys just using their ability to play sideline to sideline a small fast defense that Cal has. So a couple of three and outs for OSU. They are last in the pack in scoring offense. That has never happened since Mike Riley returned to Corvallis. Harper out of bounds at the 37 yard line. So that's where the Golden Bears will get it back. 34 yards on the 35 yard kick. One of the things I'll pay attention to in tonight's game is where they utilize Dylan Wynn up front. Defensive lineman who, you know, was sort of a star at the defensive end position and now as a senior. They moved him inside more consistently, but we'll still see him out on the edge some in certain sets, especially when they go to some of their sub packages. This is Lasco gets away from a couple of would be tacklers and he's across the 45 to the 46. With Jared Goff has taken a beating in recent weeks from other opponents and we've seen early in tonight's game this defensive front from the Beavers have been able to pressure Jared Goff as well. This is the Bears offense normally known for getting the football out of the hands of the quarterback very quickly makes the pass rush difficult to get home but they've had success so far. The ball slips out of his hand there and it's immediately ruled incomplete. The obligatory scrum for the football but the referee was waving immediately as it came out of Goff's hand. He's Chilly conditions can certainly wreak havoc for a quarterback in his possession of the football. You know what? I don't know. I think that's a fumble. I think that's a fumble. And if there's an immediate recovery, this is an opportunity for them to still go back and take another look at this play and rule that if there's an immediate recovery, that the team who recovers the football can possess it. Cal able to get the play off and deny the chance to review it and it looked like first down yardage on the run. We'll see. Jabril Johnson stopped Daniel Lasko right at the chain. Well, that to me looked like an empty hand not even coming forward. You know you normally look for that empty hand coming forward but Jared Goff he hadn't even finished the back throwing motion to start his arm going forward before the ball came loose. Sonny Dykes disappointed that he did not get a replay on the last offensive possession on a sideline catch or incompletion. <laughs> Perhaps a, a little karma. There. <laughs> this time it goes in his favor as the chains come out. This is a matter of a front foot or back foot spot. Short. So right at the 42 yard line Cal in its own territory a decision to make and it looks like they will punt. Well, getting away with a punt in this scenario much better off for Cal than what I believe the situation should be as that ball came loose from Jared Goff. Ramel Dockery back to receive for OSU both of these punt teams gave up a touchdown on special teams a week ago. It's Charles Nelson for Oregon against Cal Ty Montgomery on the farm for Stanford against OSU inside of 530 and Cal punting it away. Dockery signaling fair catch and out across the 20 he brings it in. 
Let's go to San Francisco and Mike Yan for a game break. Thank you, Mike. Anthony, any thoughts on the South? Your guess is as good as mine. That Arizona football team and Rich Rodriguez, they've improved as much as anyone as we've gotten through the regular season, especially in the conference play. Getting more and more impressive, especially on the defensive side of the football. Keep an eye on Utah and ASU tonight in the desert as well. Mannion to the air, and there is the first first down of the game for Oregon State. Jordan Villeman makes the catch. Villeman, a big body, a physical presence there at wide receiver, catches the ball cleanly. A football player that hasn't really gotten to practice so much with the team since he joined this program last year, had some academic issues that caused him to not be able to play in any games or to practice with the team much after the academic year started. But they really love the progress he's made, especially in recent weeks. 's Ron Ward on play action Mannion keeps it to the near sideline good defensive coverage there by Stephen McClure and also Cameron Walker continuing the thought there on Jordan Villeman I found it interesting what offensive coordinator John Garrett said this week that OSU is learning what he does best and they're tailoring their offense to his preferred routes. I believe he's one of the more physically gifted players they have at the wide receiver position. Doesn't have that straight line speed that a Victor Bolden does, but overall, when you just look at the frame that he possesses, 6'4", they list him at 240. I don't know if he's quite 240 pounds as I look at him in person, but he's just a big physical body that can run. Cal brings the blitz from the edge, and Mannion throws right over the top of it. It'll be third down and short following the catch by Victor Bolden. Mannion, with that height he has in the pocket at six foot five, able to usually throw it and complete passes over the oncoming rushers, willing to stand in the pocket even when he does take some physical blows for Victor Bolden. This guy's been working through an injury with his right pinky, and they say that the cast on that right hand and the way he has he's had to buddy take the fingers throughout the season has gotten smaller and smaller almost on a weekly basis. Youngest receiving core in the league with a couple of freshmen and a sophomore starting tonight. Mannion to the air on third down and three. Wanted Caleb Smith, and it was jarred loose. Caleb Coleman delivered the contact as the ball arrived. Oregon State ends up going empty. Thought in that scenario, maybe Kyle would add a rusher, bring some additional pressure. Didn't need to here. Catchable ball from Caleb Smith. Just slips right through his hands. You know he's got a sense of the defenders coming in. And Caleb Coleman, not known as a huge thumper, but does just enough to scare Caleb Smith into dropping the pass. So a false start and a drop already for Caleb Smith. You asked for big tight end production tonight from OSU. So far, both offenses still looking for it, and that's a shank. It's going to take a while for the side judge to spot this one. A 29-yard line. So 346 to go and for the first time ever the Pac-12 football championship game will be held at the new state-of-the-art Levi Stadium in Santa Clara. We got a sneak peek last week with Cal as they played Oregon. Be sure to get your tickets at pack-12.com slash tickets pack-12.com slash tickets so you can explore Levi's and witness the conclusion to this Pac-12 football season. A new drive for Jared Goff. He spins away from pocket pressure. Great throw on the run. Steven Anderson, the redshirt junior from San Jose, emerging. With other players at the wide receiver position out of the lineup for Cal, Steven Anderson has been a guy over the last couple of games who's really shown himself as a playmaker in this offense. Golden Bears working quickly now to the ground they go with Lasco a big gash off the right side great lead blocking that's a gain of seven on first down. When you think about the catching ability of these wide receivers I really think it's the blocking is part of what they do that goes underrated it's one thing for the offensive line to try and move bodies with extreme prejudice but at the wide receiver position the way you stop block people underrated part of Cal's offense. Lasco again to the 38. He had 186 all-purpose against Oregon. 86 and a touchdown rushing. Also eight receptions for 101 yards. He was the first 100-yard receiving back for Cal 
since the year 2000. It's the biggest difference between the air raid and this version of Sonny Dykes' bear raid. They stick with him. He got away from the first beaver, and he spilled as he picks up 11 more. Finally chopped down by Larry Scott. As Daniel Lasco on the inside zone gets the football, doesn't mind pressing the hole at the last second, bounces it outside, and if Larry Scott wouldn't have made that tackle, Daniel Lasco might have gone for his gump there. So traction at last for the Bears' offense. Nick and Wary spelling him a good gash on first down. And this is what OSU was afraid of defensively. They felt like first down was the most important down because if Cal doesn't get in front of the change, they become one dimensional. And that's really what Oregon State wanted to have happen is to make Cal's offense one dimensional, and even as effective as they are throwing the football. And Wary again, he had a very physical touchdown run against the Ducks. That play blown dead before he was even taken down. And those fancy shoes must belong to someone important. And it is Jaquiz Rogers who's back in town for homecoming. Some NFL kicks. NFL kicks, NFL pedigree at the skill position for his B program over the years. Third down and six for Jared Goff. Cal needs the 17-yard line. Play clock at six. They roll the pocket to his left. He throws to the end zone. Bryce Triggs, his intended target. Nothing doing in a field goal situation here for Cal. The officials are allowing a bit of physicality. In the secondary, Bryce Treggs came up at the end looking for a flag because there was some contact while the ball was in flight. But as long as there's consistency from the back judge not making that call, I don't mind it. Let him play. So this will be 40 for James Langford, who missed from just inside of 50 earlier tonight. High snap, but it's down, and that kick is true, and Cal grabs a three-point lead. So 136 yards to 47 in Cal's favor, but only a field goal advantage to show for. Talk about the improvements that they've made in the red zone this season. They haven't spent any real time in the red zone tonight. But they have been moving the ball effectively on the majority of the drives they've had in the first quarter. And as the ball is moved by Cal and they've mixed the tempo in and out in different points of the game so far. But Oregon State's defense has done a nice job just kind of figuring it out each drive. So overall, Steven Anderson was certainly the star of the game so far with the big first quarter that he's had. But Cal averaging better than 41 points per game and also home to the worst statistical defense in the conference. We thought we might get some fireworks, but what's your impression of a low scoring first quarter? Surprising. Surprising that this first quarter would be low scoring, but when you look at the way that both offenses have operated overall, I think Oregon State has left some meat on the bone in several games with the way they've operated, but we know the talent of Sean Mannion that he has connected to that right shoulder. Mel Dockery will not get a chance as this hops through the end zone. And so a touchback with 119 left in the first quarter and a late flag as there were some extracurriculars and I think they caught a beaver for unsportsmanlike. Again, OSU more penalty flags than any other team in the Pac-12, and a lot of them have not really been in what you would describe as the run of play. They've been pre- or post-snap, just silly flags. Not normally what a Mike Riley team would be known for, some of those types of infractions, but certainly had their fits and starts with that. Looks like there may be a Cal component to this as well as our referee Terry Layden is chatting with Mike Riley, who Began his career as a defensive GA for the Golden Bears under Mike White back in the mid-70s. 
Interesting, wasn't it, to see two separate columns in the Oregonian and a lot of discussion on talk radio about Mike Riley's future? Who would have thought we'd come to that point at 4-3 and three on the season? There are two fouls on the play. Two numbers of two players of the same number participating on the kicking team. This is a five-yard penalty. After the play, personal foul, late hit on the receiving team. Both penalties will be enforced. Thus, we will re-kick from the 45-yard line. Got all that, Anthony? Pretty much. Ten-yard penalty. <laughs> <laughs> Well, on behalf of announcers everywhere, <laughs> the two players in the same number on the field should be worth way more than five. Can make announcers' heads explode sometimes. Wondering which guy is that? Which number 21 was that? So they'll move it up to the 45 yard line and re kick. Trevor Romain can make that James Langford can attempt a field goal if he wants. From this distance. Well, after all that, if Terry Layden would have just said 10 yard penalty, it could have been a lot quicker. You mentioned that penalties would be a factor. Already two aside for 15 yards and not yet done with this first quarter. And now Langford ready to reboot. And he puts a full leg into that one, and as predicted, it sails out the back of the end zone. So no chance for an OSU return after they went three and out on their first couple possessions. Sean Mannion finally able to move the chains. He is four of six for 31 yards through the air so far. We're still 163 yards necessary then to become the all time passing leader in Pac 12 history. You think about the expectations for this Beavers offense with the seasons that Sean Mannion has had up to this point and the explosiveness that they've been able to put out on the football field that Mike Riley is had no shortage of praise for the way that that Mannion has shown patience with these younger football players he's got. They go right down the line to Victor Bolden, and he's reaching for a first down, driven out by Jalen Jefferson defensively for Cal. Bolden, OSU's leader, both by receptions and yardage, despite missing the USC game with that aforementioned injury. By the way, Victor's younger sister, Tori, is on the Cal soccer team. They beat OSU 5-0 on Friday. I asked her who she was rooting for. She says it was a very tough decision, but she's going with blood. <laughs> She's rooting for Victor and OSU tonight. Tight end screen, Connor Hamlet to the 40. Five yard pickup on first down. And I think continue to feed the tight ends the ball. And Caleb Smith has had a rough first quarter so far. Connor Hamlet's really the main guy. When you look at the multifaceted skill set that he has as an inline blocker, an athletic route runner, great soft hands as a receiver. He's not as fast as Smith. But feed that tight end the football. Twins to his left as he hands off to Storm Woods. He was not contacted until he was three or four yards beyond the line of scrimmage. He's out near midfield with a fresh set of downs. The interior blocking is really where this is made. Down blocks there from both the guard and tackle positions as they wall the defenders down. No cut necessary from Storm Woods. Seven seconds left for Mannion and the Beavs to run a play before this quarter expires. And they do get it off. Woods again picking his way back to the line of scrimmage and maybe one. Good penetration there by Trevor Kelly as we end the first quarter. So just a field goal on the board here in Corvallis between a couple of teams desperate for a win. Just 46 yards passing for Sean Mannion and the Beavs in that first quarter as he pursues the Pac-12 career passing mark. Kind of track down Matt Barkley tonight, but more importantly, get his team back in the winning column. Stormwoods gets the opening carry of the second quarter, and he breaks it. Stormwoods inside the five. Stephen McClure saves six.
A 49-yard dash. We're going to watch Stormwoods press the hole here, and the interior blocking by the center and guard position is so stellar. Then he ends up cutting it backside. You see him get there to the second level and then use the speed to get outside the numbers and take off. An opportunity to go the distance, but Stephen McClure comes in right at the last moment to trip up Stormwoods. And as you see, he stays in the game for first and goal with a short play clock on play action. Ramel Dockery, touchdown! And with that toss, Mannion goes into the Pac-12's career top 10. 76 career passing scores. Docker gets a nice release inside off the quick play action. He saw it draw up Hardy Mickerson. And the celebratory Sean Mannion afterwards getting his football team the lead here early in the second quarter. Trevor Romaine punches through the PAT. And shortly into the second quarter, OSU gets the first touchdown of the game. And for Ramel Dockery, the sophomore from Tacoma, it's the first of his career. One hundred yard rushing efforts. Chris Harper from the R in Oregon State thought about bringing it out. And he will take an E. He scared me for a moment. That would have been ill-advised. <laughs> for OSU, six plays, 75 yards on the scoring drive. To grab the lead for the first time tonight. And that is exactly what Mike Riley's offense under Sean Mannion needed. To have some success in the red zone where they have struggled mightily. And you saw how the play action was set up by the big efforts of Storm Woods. Just great for this offense to get him back into the lineup tonight. And Teron Ward, an excellent player in his own right, but you get so much from one back, but then you can really expand the way you attack defense when you have multiple tailbacks that you can rely on. So here comes Jared Goff and the high-octane Bear Raid. See if they can get some traction here. First pass already near midfield. Chris Harper. My sense after that first quarter is that you see two offenses that had some fits and starts. I, I feel like the tempo and the execution offensively will pick up as this game goes forward. So first down from midfield. On the ground, they're into the Beavers territory thanks to a couple from Lasco. Lasco already 52 yards rushing. He stopped up by Ryan Murphy, who had an interception last week against Stanford. And they talk about Daniel Lasco as though he's one of, if not the most improved player on the football team. It's part of the reason they've been able to utilize the run game that much more. The offensive line bigger, more physical, but Daniel Lasco more effective running and improved vision. Four wide and Goff. Dancing around the pocket, he finds Lasco out of the backfield with a flag down at the 35-yard line. Steven Nelson on the tackle, flag down the play. Lasco has touchdowns in four straight games and six of Cal's last seven contests. Doing it both on the ground and in the air. Our referee is Terry Layden. Holding. Number 44 of the defense, 10 yard penalty by rule, first down. That's Jabrell Johnson, the senior linebacker. Some people may call it questionable, but I think overall that's a good call. I think they the got officials. the wrong guy. Yeah, the officials announced 44. That was Ramo Mangyao, the redshirt sophomore. So you're excused, Johnson. That was not you with the horse collar. Two minutes into the second quarter, first down for Cal. Luke Rubenzer could not find a crease. He is snowed under. Luke Hollingsworth, the sophomore defensive end who made his first career start last week at Stanford among the Beaver tacklers. And he's getting a lot of time because this defensive line is depleted. No Levante Barnett, Joshua James, Jalen Grimble, no K. Tongo, all missing for Mark Banker's defense. And Hollingsworth had a sack on the very first series of his collegiate career. Just joined this team in training camp. 
Also one sets up second down and 11. Beef showing pressure and they bring it on the slant. Maurice Harris got a step in front of Steven Nelson. Third down and five coming. Pass thrown low from Jared Goff, but thrown away from the defenders and the throwing radius for the receivers. We pay attention to the acrobatic aerials, but a lot of times going down to sort of the low point of football is impressive as well. Called along six, and they want to run for it, and Lasco does just that. Michael Doctor unable to stop him before the first down marker. Jared Goff counts the box, and as he sees the box get light, there are just six people within five yards of the line of scrimmage. He says, you know what, at third and six, I believe we have an opportunity to run this football. Excellent call. Good patience from Lasco. Tenth carry of the contest for Lasco. He piles ahead for a couple. Michael Doctor, Michael Doctor met him in the hole. Up there, Tony Franklin in his second season as Cal's offensive coordinator. And he gives Jared Goff the freedom to make those adjustments. They're at a check with me sort of tempo right now. And as he sends in multiple plays, Jared Goff, you won't see quite as much motion once they go check with me, but he's still got the ability from this certain formation that they're in to still change the play. This time, watch the throw. Buy some time to attempt the throw to Trey Watson, but he was smothered. Baker Pritchard and others in the area. But we'll see as the pocket starts to collapse around Jared Goff. We saw earlier in the game where he just climbed calmly into the pocket. Now that he's been under duress more throughout the game, those mechanics start to break down a bit, protects the football, but then almost jumps into the air to throw the football. And it was Dylan Wynn applying that pressure. The only Beaver with more career starts. His 40th tonight than Sean Mannion. The OSU quarterback and three-time captain. Dylan Wynn now at the three-technique position. On third down and eight. From the edge, the blitz not picked up. The throw to Harper incomplete. But that flag looks like it'll go against Larry Scott. Scott benched last week in favor of Malcolm Marble after a series of missed tackles. Went right back to work. Pass in interference. Room. Number 15 of the defense. Spot foul, automatic first down. Undeterred, but not making the improvement that OSU fans had hoped for. The arm strength of Jared Goff just immense to even be able to get the football out there. From Larry Scott, not the man that you met with in studio just a few days ago. Not the commissioner of the Pac-12 Conference, <laughs> Larry Scott. A good call from the officials on the flag. Got a little too handsy. Again, they're using Jordan Rigsby in the backfield as a huge lead blocker. Goff has all day, and he threw nearly an interception. Ryan Murphy can't believe it. As you can see, another flag down in the OSU secondary. Almost had his second in as many weeks. Jared Goff just looks a little rattled to me because he's got so much space and opportunity to either run the football, deliver it short there to Daniel Lasco. He decides to throw it really in the coverage and through a very underthrown, ill-advised ball that Ryan Murphy could have taken the other way. Second down. Ineligible receiver downfield was the call against Cal and it's declined. Set up second down in 10. That really should have been a very easy play. Hope sort of a half roll action. The entire side of the field is wide open for golf. He's got Kalfani Muhammad to his left, Daniel Lasco to his right. He chooses Muhammad. Swarmed by black jerseys. And we take a look at Cal's improvements in the red zone. Last season they were, well, just abysmal. Last in the Pac 12. This year, not only are they scoring on 88% of red zone trips, Anthony, but they're converting touchdowns on 71% of those opportunities. Making third in the Pac-12 in their red zone offense this season. It's really where they like to display that throwing radius from the wide receivers very frequently with these acrobatic catches we've come to know and love. And where they miss Trevor Davis and Kenny Lawler, both out due to injury tonight. Five on the play clock, it's third and seven. They put it on the ground again, trusting Daniel Lasco. 
and he rewards their confidence. Five straight games with a touchdown for the redshirt junior back. Well, Alejandro Crossway is really where the play is made because he pulls, kicks out there on Hollingsworth, and that trap block is what allows Daniel Lasco the opportunity, the space, the ability to burst into space and score the touchdown. His team high 10th score, eight of them have been rushing. It caps a 10 play, 75 yard drive. From the 14 on third down and long, it's Daniel Lasco to the house. Things picking up at Reeser Stadium in Corvallis as Cal answers an OSU touchdown with a long drive of their own. Daniel Lasco capping it with the touchdown scamper. And the Golden Bears set to kick off. Mel Dockery has the touchdown reception for the Beavs, and he brings it out from his own goal line. With Chris Brown leading the way, a nice juke at the 20. And he's got the 25, and that's where he'll hand it back to Sean Mannion. Another series of late flags as the players pick themselves up off the turf. It looks like Dockery is hobbled. Coaching staff tells us that he is really starting to emerge. I'm sure they're not the least bit surprised that he comes away with his first touchdown reception tonight. After the conclusion of the play, unsportsmanlike conduct, number 10 of the receiving team, half the distance to the goal. This is number 10's first unsportsmanlike conduct foul of the game. So Caleb Smith there. And so we take a look at Sean Mannion as he continues his pursuit of Matt Barkley. 49 yards through the air tonight. He came in needing 194. And connecting on a short touchdown in his most recent drive. And as we were talking about just a moment ago, it does seem like both offenses are now starting to get a bit more of a rhythm. It's funny how that operates in football at times where both defenses were, were doing well. They were playing hard through the first quarter, but you could tell there was something about the, the rhythm and the execution offensively that was aiding both defenses. Throws it right down the line to Victor Bolden. Cameron Walker knocked him off his feet at the 19-yard line. After a gain of six. One of the things that Mike Riley and the staff talked about with Victor Bolden is how he's really had to try to take the mantle with Sean Mannion of being the offensive leader, even though you know, at this point in his career, he's still a young player. He's just a true sophomore. And so for him being the most experienced receiver, aside from Richard Mullaney, who's been out of the lineup, it really shows the youth that you referenced earlier, JB, for this receiver position. And a strong right formation with two tight ends. They go left, and they pick up that first down. It's Bolden again before Stephen McClure finally stopped him. And this is the tennis match. We're just seeing some body blows here in the initial part of the drive where the defense is being threatened outside the numbers, forcing them to chase laterally. And what that does is now you start to tire out that pass rush a bit where Cal doesn't really have an imposing pass rush anyway but it gives now the ability as we see the eye formation for you to come back and start to pound them with the run after landing some early body blows. And in nine of his first 11 as he takes a deep drop to throw again and airing it out. There is a flag. Jordan Villeman running with Darius Allensworth. Matchup of red shirt freshman. Pass interference. Number two of the defense. 15 yard penalty. Automatic first down. Allensworth was just so out of control. I believe if he could have gathered himself more, you see the hand fighting there initially, and Villeman appears to be pushing off with the right arm as much as Allensworth is trying to maintain and gain his own ability to keep some sort of some sort of balance as he's running. You see him stumbling. Both players hand fighting. They've allowed that earlier in the game. Want some consistency. 
Victor Bolden off the bootleg from Sean Mannion, who's on the money. Well, Sean Mannion, even though he's not fleet of foot, he's gotten better and better throughout his career, throwing on the move, staying in rhythm, squaring his shoulders to the line of scrimmage, and being accurate, especially with the deeper ball off the bootleg. 22-yard pickup for Victor Bolden, who leads the team with 30 grabs and moves the chains here again. Manning and the Beavs set up at the 27-yard line. Looking Villeman all the way and got his head turned around late. The ball was already passing. There are impressive targets. And one of the things that Mike Riley pointed out to us was we were asking him about the, the mentality of Sean Mannion and what he's dealt with and the struggles that they've had in the passing game this year. Mike Riley said he's communicated to Sean Mannion that he believes this is the most impressive season of quarterback play of Sean Mannion's career because of what he's dealt with, because of the youth, the three senior offensive linemen that have been gone from last season and additional injuries there as well. Teron Ward working against the grain. Twice now the Bees have had success cutting it back right. Michael Lowe may have saved the touchdown. And it's the initial press of the hole that allows it because you draw the linebackers and the safeties in towards the interior, and then once you cut it back, that's what allows it. You see him up there, and especially the small stature of Teron Ward, the vision at the linebacker position. You don't really see him quite as quickly, and then all of a sudden he bursts out the back door. 85 yards rushing for OSU as this drive continues. Play clock getting short. Connor Hamlet, the tight end in motion. They're looking back his way. And I think Mannion knew that that was going <laughs> nowhere. He lives to see another down. He was trying to complete the pass to the first down marker. That's essentially what he did on purpose there. I think he hit his target too, Anthony. Pretty we close. know he's, he's had some success in skills competitions <laughs> over the summer. See what he's done so far tonight. I don't need my uh, calculator to know he's with 100 yards of the passing mark, right? I'd say that's roughly accurate. Give or take, yeah, no, you're good. I didn't even have to take my shoes off to <laughs> use my toes. <laughs> Main in the beef searching for the lead. 7.35 to go, second quarter. Out of the eye. It's Ward again. Hard running. Harrison will flee, and others Drive along that Cal defensive good. front stopped him up. See Roman Sapolo there, the redshirt senior starting at right guard. Across from him, Fred Lauina is at left guard. They're without Isaac Sayumalo, as we know. Gavin Andrews still a no-go at right tackle. Will Hopkins also missing. So this is a makeshift offensive line. And as much as we've talked about the receivers, Anthony, the coaching staff thinks the cobbled together O-line has had more to do with the lack of statistical success. Empty backfield here, going with the spread set. Good pocket for Mannion. He finds Billman, who dropped it in the end zone. But when you say that Mannion has been better and he's had to be in other facets, one of them is looking beyond mistakes like this. He looked off the safety. He kept his vision towards the center of the field, showed some eye discipline. That allowed the void in the zone that Billman worked his way into. Everything was done properly on that play, aside from just squeezing the ball at it as it hit both hands of Jordan Villeman. And not only did you see Manny with a very composed lack of reaction, which I think is important, as the field goal is punched through from 30, but he goes and finds that receiver on the sideline and picks him up because he knows he's going to go that way again tonight. Six forty-four to go before the half. Cal and OSU tied at ten. These are a couple of programs that both started the year four and one. Things were looking good. Cal even briefly had control of the Pac-12 North, but things went south in the month of October for both of them. Trying to get back on track here tonight. Two wins shy of bowl eligibility. Trey Watson, Kalfani Muhammad, back to receive for the Golden Bears, and it's the freshman back Watson. Just outside his own five. Had a good head of speed. He got the 30-yard line as well before he was driven out of bounds. Give him 27 yards on the return. The 
Got plenty of time here for Cal's offense. They even attempt to get a two for one in here. They can get multiple possessions by the end of the second quarter. See if they can get Jared Goff back in rhythm as well. Using that run game was key on the previous drive. Four wide set, quick throw, Chris Harper to the 40. Right into the face mask of Larry Scott, driven out of bounds. And coming up on our State Farm Pac-12 football halftime report, we'll have Mike Yamrick, New Heisel, Curtis Conway, and Nick Galliotti in studio to revisit that statement win from down I-5 by the Ducks. Can the Cats bounce back? And Utah and ASU in the desert. It's all coming up on our halftime report. Velasco's had a big night on the ground so far. Michael Doctor Daniel met him in the hole. Velasco is a redshirt junior, and I bring that up because Cal has gone for more than 4,000 yards of total offense this year from the line of scrimmage. Not one of those yards has been produced by a senior. So the future of this offense, assuming they can stick together, is impossibly bright. It's an amazing stat when you think about how explosive this offense is, the rankings they have and points and passing yards, total offense within the Pac-12. These rush four, and they create some havoc in the pocket. Goff chopped down at the 49-yard line. Larry Scott making the tackle. This didn't turn into a big play because Jared Goff's just not that fast. But what I love is that he almost ran himself into trouble there and then thought better of it. Knew that the rushers were going to be oncoming from the outside. And again, the willingness to go vertical, to climb in the pocket in a forward motion. That's where you're going to evade the pass rush at a higher level. His father was an All-American for the Cal baseball team. I think he needs to take a page out of his book and learn to slide there before you get kneecapped. They roll the pocket away from Dylan Wynn. Hit as he throws his golf. He paid the price and got Powell. Big time throw and first down for Cal. Those are the type of shots you love as a defensive lineman. Just coming unblocked at quarterback, running away, and then all your momentum into the back of a QB. Dylan Wynn just laying heavy on Jared Goff. A full head of steam. So a new set of downs from the 39-yard line. Run blitz coming there. DJ Alexander off the edge. A timeout OSU before they do. We'll take the timeout with them. Cal marching deep in the first half. a good week for the orange and black Halloween of course on Friday night how about the San Francisco Giants winning their third World Series in five years OSU hoping to ride the colors to a home win the first of three consecutive league home games first time that has happened to OSU since 1998 they've got Cal on their hands now and Jared Goff has a first down from the shotgun with Daniel Lasco to his left the blitz comes Cal picks it up Goff scrambling away from it again. Jared Goff keeps the ball. Well, I think Jared Goff knew that he missed an opportunity on the previous series where the entire right side of the field was open to him to take off and run. But he is continuing to utilize those legs more and more. You do see him taking some shots here. He's been hit quite a bit throughout the season. He gained some weight. You love the fact that he's kind of tough, but should find some opportunities to slide or get out of bounds before these collisions. He's got Maurice Harris and Bryce Treggs up at the top of the formation. Instead, he's looking to the solo side where he has Chris Harper working on Larry Scott. No flags. And that's a good no call. It's a good no call for Larry Scott, one of the players who has been in the doghouse a bit as a first-year starter, but he's one-on-one -on -one with Chris Harper. Chris Harper has shown the ability to make these acrobatic, contested types of grabs. With great coverage there from Scott. Could be a big confidence builder because you do not want to be searching for answers at corner with this Cal offense and then Washington State coming to town next, although the Cougs will be without Connor Halliday. More on that in a bit.
We've hit the four minute mark. Second quarter. Back to Lasco on the ground. He's had a ton of success. And the bear raid may be becoming a bit of a misnomer because Cal is doing work on the ground between the tackles. Well, and JB, this is what the bear raid really does to separate itself from that air raid that Mike Leach and, and how mummy, you know, from even further years ago, the willingness to run the football, more opportunities on the deep ball. Lasco, a huge hole, untouched into the end zone. 21 yards for his second score. Well, Jordan Rigsby at the right tackle position just walls the defensive end up the field. Oh, boom, watch him. Gets upfield a little bit too far, doesn't press it back. That's the hole coming right into your living room, folks. Here's Daniel Lasko trying to get his team the lead, and he does. Two touchdowns tonight, 11 on his season. Point after from James Langford is good. Cal back on the high side after an eight-play, 70-yard drive, and this is more the tempo and the production we were expecting. Lasko just more and more has emerged into not just a receiving threat, not just a guy who, you know, can be a safety valve in the passing game, but we've seen more and more that this offense can lean on him to be a ball carrier. And that's one of the things that the spread can do for you when you get the box so empty and you have to worry about the wide receiver position, the arm talent of Jared Goff and that RPG he has connected to his right shoulder. But Daniel Lasko, when that box lightens, he's been able to show that he can hurt defenses on the ground. He can be a consistent ball carrier that they need. He's had to take on even more of the ball carrying load because of the fact that Kalfani Muhammad has that broken hand and they haven't been able to use him to carry the football and to receive the football at the level that they'd really like to. Velasco's already over the century mark, 148 yards on the ground for Cal combined. That's a whopping average against a pretty sound OSU defense that boasts three senior linebackers. One of the places that Oregon State has struggled in a defense that's put up great numbers this season. They have been seventh in the Pac-12 in run defense. Malcolm Marble, chance to return. Out to the 28. So here comes Sean Mannion. The headlines available to him tonight. He's chasing seven in a three-minute drive situation. OSU will start this drive on the ground. Storm Woods back as tailback. And he has seven on first down. There's a reach block at the point of attack. Little Westfield Just did what he could to still get up field. It wasn't enough. But Hardy Nicholson's having to leave the lineup. Here's his helmets off. We'll see what Oregon State operates at for tempo here with three minutes remaining. I think it would serve them well to try to be the last team with the football here in the second half, in the second quarter. Play action. A deep drop for Mannion to the near sideline. He wanted Hunter Jarman, who nearly made a stellar one-handed grab. Caleb Coleman was in coverage for Cal. Hunter Jarman was in line to make just his second career start tonight. Last week, he led the way at Stanford with 87 yards receiving. And this at least a third and short. This third and three territory, much more favorable for Oregon State. They, more than any other team in the Pac-12, have ended up when they get to third down to be third and one, third and sevens, third and eights. You can have the, more of the playbook open when you're in this third and three territory. Caleb Smith, the tight end in motion. They empty it for Mannion. He does have time to hit Storm Woods, but well behind the line of scrimmage, and he is dragged down for a loss. Michael Barton, Cal's leading tackler, was with him all the way. And perhaps because Caleb Smith dropped an early ball or he's been out of sorts with some of the, the unforced errors on the penalties, but he had Smith an opportunity there to deliver the football where Smith was beyond the sticks, but threw it short to Storm Woods and really put Woods in a position where he didn't have the angle on the oncoming tackle to try and get it for a first down. On 
Fourth and seven, Chris Harper dropping back to receive a Keith Costell punt. Mike Riley says that his senior punter has been uncharacteristically erratic. He's ninth in the Pac-12 in punting average. 40 yards per move. Next Saturday, it's a another exciting football Saturday, and we'll tell you about it in just a moment. Costle a wobbly spiral, driving Harper back to his own 20. And he loses five more before Chris Brown drags him down. And as Cal gets the football back, let's get a look at what Daniel Lasco has done so far. Well, this Bear Raid offense gets a lot of attention for the way that Jared Goff throws the football, but Daniel Lasco has been the star of the first half that's led this football team to a lead here in the second quarter. 109 rushing yards so far for this explosive sophomore tailback. He's got the ability to catch the football out of the backfield, but also the ability we've seen on display tonight to run the football, find the creases, burst in the space. Jared Goff, meanwhile, only 9 of 21 through the air. As we predicted, this OSU pass defense is pretty rigid. And Cal choosing to take what's given to them. And so far, that's been on the ground with Lasco. So as we started to say, next Saturday, another big one on the Pac-12 Network. Washington State will be here. Colorado and number 12, Arizona. The pregame show kicking off at noon Pacific. The Beavs. I guess fortunately for their chances of winning, we'll not get to see Connor Halliday, but we certainly hate to see his career in Pullman come to an end the way that it did today against USC. Luke Falk is back up, will likely get the starting nod. A deep throw over the middle, and it's incomplete. Skipped into the arms of Bryce Treggs. And to follow up with your point on Connor Halliday, I mean, extremely unfortunate. You look at the two quarterbacks we have on the field tonight with their arm talent, and Connor Halliday just as a pure passer, as a guy with an arm that can hit every blade of grass on the field and in an offense that suit him so well when he works with Mike Leach. It was really unfortunate for that Washington State program, now ineligible for a bowl opportunity this season after losing the USC today, and now, you know, their, their all-time passing leader will not be able to finish his senior season. Goff needs five, and he needs Steven Anderson, his favorite target so far tonight. Six grabs and a new set of downs. It's been a big first half. The second quarter hasn't been quite as big as the first quarter was for Steven Anderson. But you see, this is what Jared Goff is willing to do, taking what the defense has given. You see him trying to find those moments to take advantage of one-on-one -on -one matchups with Chris Harper. Nice footwork to find Lasco out of the backfield. First down yardage and more. He's to the 48 before Tyreek Zimmerman spins him down. The decision-making process has really been on point. Because you don't see Goff trying to force the ball, at least not frequently, force the ball downfield into traffic. This Oregon State secondary is doing everything they can to not allow the deep ball, not allow these receivers to get behind them. At the 20 yard catch from Lasco, he misses Maurice Harris, who was covered well by Jones Steven Nelson. That was a big third down conversion, though, just to go back to it, because if Cal punts it away there, Mannion and OSU have another chance to operate their two minute drill. Instead, this final possession is effectively Tony Franklin's. We'll see. They end up adding another rusher here, second and long. Only four. Goff has time to get it to Harris. Again, Nelson was right there with him, shoulder to shoulder. We've mentioned that this may be the best passing defense in the Pac-12. Just some evidence to back that up. Only six passing touchdowns allowed coming into tonight. Opponents completing less than 55% of their pass attempts. And nine interceptions. Those are all Pac-12 best pass defensive numbers. And I think Goff is experiencing it firsthand. Third down, the full 10. Four receivers to work with. They've had great success on third and long on the ground. Here's just the latest example. 
Trey Watson, the freshman from Corona, California. And the box count is really what it comes down to because Jared Goff has the ability to see and read this play. And so the fact that there's only six guys there within the box, within five yards of the line of scrimmage, not a lot of presence laterally there. So again, another look. And the hole didn't even need to be pressed because the receivers ran off the coverage. 104 to go if the clock stops and all three timeouts for Cal available. Rolling right. Here is her. Make that Maurice Harris. Ryan Murphy drove him out. Looking at that last run, you see here six players right there near the line of scrimmage. So Jared Goff at the quarterback position counts that, knows this is going to be an opportunity, especially by the fact that the linebackers run out of there. So you don't have any presence near the line of scrimmage to try and play downhill to defend the run. Those are the types of decisions that Jared Goff has been making as a quarterback who understands this offense at a high level. Looking to take a two-score lead into the locker room on the road in Corvallis. Maurice Harris tiptoeing out of bounds with a first down. He's coming off a career night against Oregon. He had nine grabs for 79 and a touchdown. And taking advantage of the absence of Trevor Davis and Kenny Lawler to rack up more totals tonight. Out of all the outstanding receivers who get more opportunities and more receptions than Maurice Harris, we look at last season, he may have had the most outstanding catch that anyone's seen over the last couple of years of Pac-12 football. Watson again. He wears the number five because he grew up idolizing Reggie Bush. That time went eye to eye with Justin Strong, filling in from his safety position. And Cal uses the timeout. And let us update our score bug. Cal actually has one timeout remaining. They burn their second there. We're seeing Sonny Dykes here working with Tony Franklin. And that relationship between Dykes and Franklin goes back so many years to the time that Sonny Dykes was a grad assistant. And Tony Franklin knew him way back then. And they joined each other together at Louisiana Tech as Sonny Dykes got the head coaching job there. He brought in Tony Franklin. And one of the things that Tony Franklin told him at that point is, if I'm going to come to work for you, we're good friends. But our friendship has to be set aside because I'm going to run this offense. And I don't like people getting in my kitchen trying to change my recipes up too often. And that's a difficult thing. And Sonny Dykes was honest about how difficult that's been for him. But he loves the work that Tony Franklin has been doing, especially with Jared Goff at the quarterback position. Goff to Lasco. To the perimeter and to the first down marker, maybe a yard short. Third down and one remaining with 43 seconds left in the half. Well, it goes without saying. Big stop needed here in the red zone. The Oregon State defense. I would like to see them heat up Jared Goff more frequently. He's gotten back to the point now where he's comfortable in the pocket. I anticipated seeing some of these linebackers, most notably DJ Alexander, but maybe even Michael Doctor, but starting to add more people to the rush. The four-man pressure isn't getting there. Lasco has all day to pick his lane. He's just not being contacted behind the line of scrimmage. And one of the things they can do, especially if they bring the pressure in the A-gap, maybe even if it is Jabrell Johnson, but bring someone into the B-gap, and that can essentially turn into a run blitz where you have the pass rushers. Don't move the defensive front if you don't need to. Have them rush through their regular gaps. Bring a linebacker through either the A or B-gap. That can turn into a run blitz where maybe you get a tackle for loss. 13th play of the drive for Cal as they drain the remaining seconds in this second quarter. Goff has Harris isolated, but Steven Nelson has Goff's done a great job in coverage left on an island. Steven brought Michael Doctor off the edge on that snap. Great job in pass protection from Daniel Lasco. Tony Franklin seems to be looking for a little bit of tempo here. It was an incomplete pass, but I guess he doesn't want the defense to get set. Or at least he wants the defense maybe to get set. And now they go with this check with me tempo. Harper, Powell, and Anderson there. The trips to his left from the bottom of your screen. Glasgow got tripped up as he went through the line of scrimmage. Third down coming. Third and final check. 
And Cal will use its final timeout. Now using the final timeout there, with 26 seconds remaining. So now since it's third and goal, you certainly anticipate that where the ball is on the field, they're going to pass the football anyway. But you can't throw the football shorter. I mean, you can with 26 seconds, but then you're in a hurry up mode where you got to try to run and scramble the kicker onto the field, which you would prefer not to do. I think especially because of what we've seen from Cal throughout the season, really over the past couple of years, and the catch radius that these wide receivers have, even though Kenny Lawler, Trevor Davis, they've got a couple of guys out with injury, but Chris Harper has the ability to do that as well. Steven Anderson, as he's emerged, they've got guys where you can throw it, even with coverage contesting them, into the end zone. So wasn't it interesting to talk to them about the trajectory of the throws, and Mark Banker is aware of the way that they like to run, especially the fade route or the outbreaking route towards the back corner of the end zone. He's got a secondary ready for that. 339 yards of offense already for Cal before this third and goal. Most at OSU has allowed in a first half this season. Goff able to extend the play before Wynn gets to him. He chucks it to the sideline and gives his field goal kicker a chance to tack on three before the half. Didn't force it. Certainly like the execution there at the quarterback position again. Thought about taking off and running. Saw that there wasn't going to be an opportunity to do it. So work back into the opposite direction. You always see two hands around the football from Jared Goff, which I respect. There's a lot of especially younger quarterbacks who aren't as good and sound with the mechanics of protecting the football when the rush starts to get around them. Langford hit from 40. This from 25 and the left hash out of the Bryce McGovern hole. Everything is clean and the kick is pure and it's a double digit lead heading towards the half for visiting Cal. Y'all felt like maybe there'd be an opportunity. Didn't want to force the ball back to the back pile on there. Darius Powell jumping around, hoping that Jared Goff was going to give him a chance there in the back of the end zone. And Powell, six foot three, he's a target that is easy to see. But I like the decision from Goff. Didn't want to force the football back there to him. See what Sonny Dykes and his group have been able to do going into the half. Four straight scoring possessions, a couple of Daniel Lasco scores, a couple of James Langford field goals. And granted, this is not the most potent offense in the Pac-12. In fact, right now, it's the least. I think something to build off of defensively as well. Agreed. I do agree. And right here, you know, we won't see much, I don't believe, for Oregon State's offense as they go into the half. 14 seconds remaining here if they get the football. But as you get into the halftime, some of the adjustments that I believe need to be made defensively because early in the half, we saw more pressure on the pocket. A lot of it did come from the defensive front, but the pass rush has now cooled off with the way they've been able to heat up Jared Goff in the pocket. I believe interior pressure, bringing linebackers through the A gap to rush the quarterback will help the pass rush out. Ryan Murphy and Chris Brown, the deep men, and they will not get a chance. There's a time to kick it out of bounds. I guess now is the time. 14 seconds left. We'll see if that changes the thinking for Sean Mannion. With one timeout left, might they take a shot to get into field goal range? Oregon State has chosen to put the ball in play at the 35-yard line. First down. I believe the standard Beavers way to operate here if they don't take a knee. We won't see them heaving the ball down the field and try to complete a short pass out towards the sideline. See if they do the pick 35. up a chunk play from it. He's got four receivers to work with. They're certainly in that posture. And a good platform from which to throw. Cedric Dozier got to the ball first, and it looks like Cal has an interception. They do. Well, the former wide receiver has been described as one of the most improved players on this Cal defense, and he gets his first pick to close out the first half. And there, some body did get in to the wide receiver, Hunter Jarman. They both went up fighting for the football in the air. But Dozier 
able to fight for the position and win that battle with the ball in flight. Reeser Stadium right now sounds like the library. This crowd is stunned. It sounds like they're going to take a look at this play to see if Cedric Dozier made a clean catch on the ball. He had two hands around it, but then as the ball goes down towards the ground, you see Hunter Jarman, they collide with each other. The ball definitely hit the ground. You'll sometimes see the official allow that if they feel like the person receiving the football, the person making the catch has complete control of the ball, they'll allow it to be touched in certain situations. I don't know that from what I saw on either angle there that I fully believe that Cedric Gozer had full control of the ball as it hit the ground. Manion did throw for the short touchdown in this first half, but he is on track for career lows virtually across the board statistically. Came in with seven touchdowns, picked up his eighth tonight. This would be his sixth interception if it stands, but the touchdown number in particular just stands in stark contrast to the 37 he had a season ago. You know, Mike Riley's new offensive coordinator, John Garrett, came in, and he said he didn't know Sean Mannion from Adams, so he kind of went to work on the media guy. After further review, it was determined that the pass was incomplete. Possession will be given back to Oregon State, second and 10 at the 35-yard line. Good explanation there. And just to finish that thought, Garrett looked at the numbers, and he thought, those are pretty good career stats. What he didn't know is he was looking at 2013 alone. <laughs> for Sean Mannion. Well, you look at the numbers that Brandon Cooks put up as well with 107 receptions. Leading receiver Victor Bolden up to this point with 30 catches earlier in the game. Stark contrast in the passing game 2014 B's versus 2013. And certainly it's not all on Mannion in the offense. We mentioned 339 yards for the Cal offense. Most that Oregon State hasn't allowed opponents this year. So they've got some adjustments to make too. Granted, it's not all about the yardage when you play Cal, but 20 points as well. Drea Avent is with Sunny Dice. Thanks, JB. Coach, your team found a lot more rhythm offensively in the second quarter, especially on the ground. What changed at that point? Well, we just started executing a little better. We didn't convert a couple of short yardage situations early on some drives. Um, just never really found a rhythm in the first quarter, but we got settled in and got adjusted, and, and the guys have executed pretty well. Now that you have the momentum, what's the key to keeping everything going on both sides of the ball in the second half? Well, we just got to keep playing. Got to keep playing. Got to take care of the football and create some turnovers on defense and, and be solid in the kicking game. And uh, we're in a good spot. We just got to finish it off. All right, Coach, thank you. All right, thanks. Let's send it back to JB and Anthony. Thank you, Drea. And we're going to go to the State Farm Halftime Report with Mike Yam, Rick Neuheisel, Curtis Conway, and Nick Aliotti. Cal doubling up OSU in Corvallis. Minute away from the start of our second half. Here is your game summary with Cal in front of OSU 20 to 10. Daniel Lasco, the story of the first half, 18 rushes for 127 and both the Cal touchdowns. Then Daniel Lasco has made them pay. And part of the mental aspect of the success that's been had is that box count that we talked about, JB, as Jared Goff has the ability to see what the defensive front is giving them and then try to determine whether or not he should hand the ball off to Lasco and 18 carries in. That's really where this Cal offense has been able to start to gash the Beavers D. Ryan Murphy dropping to receive this kick from James Langford. How important are points here on this opening drive of the second half for OSU? Well, it's key. You know, obviously there's a long second half to go here, but to come out with something, at least a field goal, or even if you don't score something, but just to have a successful drive and try to get some rhythm going on offense, it's going to be very important for Oregon State. Murphy brings it out. He's got the 20 and the 25. So a good decision as he picks up an extra yard before he hands it over to Sean Mannion, who came into tonight needing 194 yards through the air to become the Pac-12's career passing leader. Supplanting Matt Barkley. And in the first half, he was 11 of 18 for 91 yards and a touch through the air. So he needs 103 more, which on a normal night would be well within his reach. First to 10 I really think Sean Mannion's played pretty well 
in the first half. Well, even though we've only seen the one touchdown pass, but overall, I think the decision making has been sound. Well, I like the way he's throwing the football. I need to see more separation from the receivers. They go away from the fly sweep action and choose Teron Ward. Good pickup on first down. Give him four on the carry. Nearly identical to how Oregon State started the football game on their first offensive possession. And when you look at the success that they had on the ground in the first half, and Storm Woods, his 77 rushing yards on the ground, a couple of those explosive runs. Certainly can't forget about it just because you're down by multiple scores here early in the third. Just one Pac-12 win in their last nine tries. They've got some work to do here in the second half at home. A great pocket for Mannion. Victor Golden. Could not connect with Cedric Dozier chasing in coverage. We're seeing off the releases with a couple of these opportunities that Sean Mannion is throwing the football and it's sort of drifting on him more towards the outside where there's some space available for him to deliver the football towards the middle of the field. Now, Stefan McClure at the safety position may have been in, in a better spot to try and make the play if he drew, delivered it more towards the middle, but that's really where Victor Bolden was going to have an opportunity to play the ball, but that ball just sort of tailed on Mannion towards the outside. They send Ward out to the bottom of your screen and go empty. OSU still looking for its first third down conversion of the Knights. And they've got it. Jordan Villeman hangs on. And Michael Lowe draped all over him. We've talked about the physical tools of Jordan Villeman throughout the game. And we've seen it on display, you know, even in their game against Utah, you know, fourth and goal. Try to keep the Beavers in that contest. Jordan Billman made an outstanding back shoulder touchdown grab. There was physical tools there, but he did have a big drop in the end zone early in the half. And those sorts of inconsistencies is what you'll see from younger players at times. Back to two tight ends and back to the ground on first down. Picking his way for two is Teron Ward. That cut back, back lane continues to be there. He decided not to bounce it towards the outside and kind of cut it back against the grain as we saw both Jerron Ward and Storm Woods have success doing in the first half. But the linebacker position needs to make sure they stay in position to try and defend that cut block, that cut back as the backs from Oregon State press the hole. Saw a lot of breath in that huddle. It is cold, dipping below 50 degrees now, but so far it's been dry here in Corvallis. Mannion, just as soon as I say it, throws a slipper in football, picks it up, and scampers within two of the first down. In similar fashion to what we saw from Jared Goff in the first half, as the throwing motion is just coming back from Sean Mannion, the ball in these chilly conditions that you just referenced, JB, slipping out of the hands of Sean Mannion. Had the presence of mind, though, to pick it up and get something out of the play. It drizzled in true Corvallis fashion for about two, two and a half hours prior to kickoff. But since we've started, it's been relatively clear. Another third down for Mannion, trying to set up the screen, and his back, Ward, got caught up in the wash. Let's see what Mike Riley wants to do here. And it's a pass rush from Cal that just hasn't been penetrating to the degree that you would think it sets up for a screen to be that successful. You know, especially middle screen, you know, maybe you try one that's more towards the outside where you get an opportunity to, to maybe cut it back against the grain once he received the ball in the open field. So a first down and 23 yards on the opening drive for OSU, but they punt it away to Chris Harper, a low kick and short that he comes up to field outside his own 15 yard line. So Jared Goff and the Golden Bears with the lead and the football. Oregon State comes up empty on its opening possession of the third quarter, so they punt it back to Cal. The Golden Bears with a 10-point lead on the road. And Jared Goff set for his first third quarter drive. With Anthony Heron, J.B. Long with you in Corvallis at Research Stadium. Aaron Owens is our producer tonight. Martin Tarr, our director, glad you're with us to finish the night of Pac-12 football. A couple more teams becoming bowl eligible already tonight with USC and Washington winning. That makes seven for the league. Goff in four wide. To the far sideline, Maurice Harris makes the catch. Harris. Stephen 
And that topic of bowl eligibility is what makes this such a big game tonight with two four win teams coming in and some tough games remaining in the month of November. Both teams look at this as a contest that they feel like they should win and really I feel like if they don't then it'll make the path to bowl eligibility so difficult for each club. Lasco on the pitch. Good cut block on the perimeter. And he's got a first down out across the 34 yard line. That's why, that's why you anticipated some urgency coming into tonight's game because of having those four wins. And when you look at the North standings here, the Cal with their four and four overall record, down at number four in the division, and Oregon State with their four and three record coming in. Cal looking for its first win in the state of Oregon since 2007. And Chris Harper was one clean block away from getting away from Tyreek Zimmerman and maybe taking that the distance. Securing tackles is something that Oregon State improved on, you know, from the early portion of the season. And Mark Banker's defense, especially at the corner position on the outside, with Steven Nelson, Larry Scott, they've been fairly secure tacklers, whether they've been in tight coverage or whether they've been in off coverage. They both have done a nice job overall. Lasco right side got past Justin Strong spun away from a second tackler and he must have hit a knee as he did because he quit on that run. Lasco again, the ball carrier. He must have just barely and briefly hit a knee. I thought maybe that was an outstanding move that he made. You know we're up here in the ivory tower in the press box here but the knee must have gone down. It was quick though. How about this move. Wow. The left knee did just touch before he got up and spun away. Off to the near side, Bryce Traggs with a nice adjustment to make a tough catch. At least one catch in 23 straight games for the junior from Inglewood. The ball this does end up grazing the turf. He did control the football, but too much of the ball got the ground for them to rule it a catch. Raymond Hudson makes his seventh catch of the season, the redshirt freshman from Pleasanton, California. So that's good for another Cal first down. Raymond Hudson there again making the catch. Inside of 10 minutes to go, third quarter. Lasco sweeping right. Hollingsworth able to wrap him up. Siali Houtau as well. It's part of what they do to you because of, you know, we keep using the term box count. I mean, that literally means that Jared Goff, as he turns his eyes and looks towards the defense, he is counting not only the front four, but who are the linebackers and safeties within an attack position near the line of scrimmage to determine whether or not he feels they should run the ball. Goff on the slant. Hudson again inside the red zone. DJ Alexander hung on to the tackle. I'd like to see Ryan Murphy, Tyreek Zimmerman start to work their way, creep toward the line of scrimmage more to run the alley more efficiently, more effectively before the running backs can start to get some, some steam going into the second and third levels of the defense. They can support the run better, and it's, it's counterintuitive against Cal's offense, but I don't know that Jared Goff is throwing the ball with enough accuracy right now. That's why you see them leaning on the run. Vic and Wary into the Cal backfield now. Looking for the edge, and he's got it, and the touchdown. A new Pac-12 high rushing total for Cal on the night. They go north of 200 yards for their third rushing score. The physicality that in where he normally runs the football with, you see that he's got the Jets to turn the corner, tight roping the sideline and just getting inside that front pylon. Langford's point after is good. So for the second week in a row, Vic and Wary, the freshman from Missouri City, Texas, gets a score. This one caps a nine-play, 82-yard drive for a 27-10 lead. Vic and Wary celebrating his second touchdown in his career and his second in as many weeks. He's a guy who brings the thump usually, 
at 220 pounds, a true freshman, extremely intelligent ball carrier. Malcolm Marble on this kick return. Got a block at the 20. Now he's got the edge. Best return of the night for Oregon State. We'll see if that jump starts their offense, trailing 17. It was an outstanding block out on the edge. We talked about the stalk blocking abilities of wide receivers, and Maurice Harris right there is just going to come up, work his way towards Steven Nelson, chop him down right there outside the numbers, and that's where first downs turn into touchdowns. The overall rushing numbers tonight from the two teams, 219 yards from Cal so far in this game. Still 842 remaining in the third quarter. Just an outstanding running effort here from this Bear Raid offense. Javid Bass used to do it himself in this Cal uniform. 255 is the season high on the ground for Cal, but that came against FCS, Sacramento State at home. This is an entirely different task. Storm Woods picks up two, and Anthony, you and I were chatting off the air that it's not at the point yet where Sean Mannion and Beavs have to come out of their game plan chasing 27-10 on the scoreboard. Agreed. It's not at the point yet where they need to completely abandon the run, especially with the success that they've had running the ball overall. It's definitely at the point where they need to mount a drive, though. This Oregon State offense needs to draw a line in the sand and say, we're going to start to impose our will upon the opponents. Easier said than done, but this Cal defense has not been stout throughout the season. A strong right, two tight end sets. Diving catch made. Victor Bolden. That'll leave third and short. Probably a full two. Victor Bolden, the guy at only five foot nine. So his throwing radius, his catch radius is not what you see from some of these other bigger wide receivers. But he goes out and gets the football outside his cage. An outstanding grab. Third down has been rough for OSU. Just one of seven so far tonight. They need this one. Cannot afford to go three and out. See some additional presence from Stephen McCool walked up to the outside. Bears bring the blitz. Good pickup. Even better catch by Jordan Villeman. And a much needed first down for OSU. Michael Lowe eventually ran him out for Cal. That's why I made it a point to specifically ask John Garrett about Jordan Villeman. Just with the productivity he's begun to show more and more in recent weeks, but you see the immense physical tools that he has at that size, catches the ball cleanly with his hands away from the body. He's not a guy that fights the football in. Play clock at six. Villeman in motion. Mannion gets it off. Again, a great platform to launch. It's Villeman again. McClure drives him to the turf at the 15. Twenty-six yards on the pickup. We saw that pass in rhythm from Mannion. Pocket extremely clean. It's a pass rush 11 in the Pac-12 from Cal. So the expectation coming in was that Sean Mannion should have been able to be clean throughout tonight's game and he has. Touchdown for Cal on their opening drive of the second half. Mannion looking for the answer and he's going down. Todd Barr with a flag down deep in the secondary. Barr forced a fumble last week against Oregon. We'll see if the flag erases his sack. Todd Barr is a player that been waiting for him to sort of learn how to utilize space Holding. effectively. Number three of the defense, half the distance of the goal. First down will be repeated. Cameron Walker caught. So that proves costly. It would have been the 24 sack that OSU has allowed this season. They gave up 25 all of last season to put that into contact. So. Sean Mannion has been under heavy duress with his offensive line cobbled together week by week. We've been number 11 in the Pac-12 this season with the way they've protected the quarterback and the sacks that have been given up with those 23 total. 
And I mean, the last three teams that they faced this season, we talked about it earlier. I mean, the three defenses that OSU has most recently played. And you look at Utah, and Stanford. Those opponents they've had on the schedule who get after the quarterback at a very high level. Pro USC in that mix, and those are three of the top four defenses in the league. The other one, at least coming into tonight, was OSU. So things were supposed to get easier for them offensively. So far has not been the case. See if they can respond. Already inside of six minutes to go, third quarter. Play action to the end zone, and this time Jordan Villeman hangs on. Mannion gave him another chance, and the red shirt freshman delivers. The chance he gave him, he hummed the football in there. I mean, this pass from Sean Mannion had a smoke screen behind it because he knew coverage was tight, window was going to close very soon, and on the back shoulder, Jordan Villeman comes up with the grab. Sean Mannion pumping the fist, knowing this opportunity for a victory may have slipped away if they didn't make that play. Trevor Romaine tacks on the PAT. OSU gets the touchdown back. A five-play, 65-yard drive and an eight-yard touchdown from Mannion. Slowly but surely, the fifth-year senior, Sean Mannion, is creeping up on Matt Barkley. More importantly, his second touchdown of the night brings his team back within 10 points. Coming into the season, I really thought it was going to be several weeks ago that Sean Mannion would surpass Matt Barkley for the all-time passing record. It's come much deeper into the year than was anticipated, but he's on the precipice at this point. Chris Harper will bring it out. Harper across the 15. A flag flies as he crosses the 20. It's actually Trey Watson who picks it up, and we'll go to Mike Yam in San Francisco. All right, JV, time now for a GoRVing.com game break. UCLA up 10-7 on Arizona. Brett Hundley, though, changing that to 70-yard bomb to Jordan Payton. Got six catches, 119 yards. That score, Bruins on top, 17-7. And you see the log jam across those Pac-12 standings. ASU, Arizona, Utah, all with one loss. So the flag against Cal backs them up to the 10 yard line as they begin a new drive. Jared Goff, 18 of 35 through the air for 202 yards, but they've got 219 on the ground. And how about that surge from the offensive line? Chris Barrio, among others, leading the way up front. Off to Bryce Triggs, hit immediately and driven out right at the stakes. Good hit by Larry Scott. It will depend on the spot. It looks like they'll put the ball down just short, Anthony, to set up third down. And seeing indecision from the defensive front of Oregon State. I mean, it's the second play of the drive, and they're in two-point stances. There's no reason that the Beavers' defensive line should be gassed already at this point this early in the drive. There needs to be urgency. Goff will throw for it, and he's got Treggs by the jersey. He's pulled out at the 30. Just want to say a word on the offensive line for Cal, because last year they used nine different starters, Anthony, in six different combinations. This year they have not been perfect by any means, but last week might have been their best. And I think because, you know, they've only missed one start between them. It's been a lot of the same guys week in and week out. Maybe they're building some cohesion. Goff steps up, hit as he throws. Dylan Wynn got him again. The pass is incomplete. Goff has worn a couple throughout this night. Dylan Wynn had to defeat multiple blockers to get home on the rush. You see him there working off the offensive tackle. Then there was a running back chipping as well. Dylan Wynn still gets home, still lets Jared Goff feel him. Every pound of Dylan Wynn, all 275 of them. Second and 10. That's a player that will always show urgency on the football field. Seen him inside a lot. Now he's on the edge. Trey Watson gets the carry and not much doing. 
Gang tackled and keeping the feet moving for a bit. But third down and long coming for Cal. And this is finally the situation in which Oregon State wants to be defensively. And I believe a situation where they need to add another pass rusher. The front four isn't getting it done. Working back in coverage, even in their subgroups, where sometimes they've dropped eight people in the coverage. That hasn't gotten the job done. They need to heat up Jared Goff, and they need to do it right now. I saw that 9 of 14 number on third down for Cal, which has been outstanding. The delayed blitz comes, and it got there in a hurry. Cyril Nolan Lewis. A missile from the secondary. Coming right up the gut through the A-gaps from the strong safety position, Nolan Lewis. Unexpected from Jared Goff has eyes downfield and covers him that before he knows it, the safety Nolan Lewis is right in the chops. Move back to safety from outside linebacker, and he blitz like a linebacker there. My goodness, fourth and 14, and Cal forced a punt. Well, Mark Banker and I on the same page there. Heat him up, let him feel you. And they're not going to get this play off. Delay a game will back him up five more. Delay of game. Offense. Five yard penalty. Remains fourth down. Mark Tummerdahl in charge of special teams for Cal. Again, they gave up a punt return for a touchdown last week against Oregon. Steven Nelson drops for OSU here. Leininger gets a high, tight spiral that checks up at the 45 and comes back to midfield. So great field position for Oregon State. They trail by 10 on their home field against Cal. Cal 27, OSU with the football and 17 points on the scoreboard. And we found a special Beavers fan in attendance there. That is... Joanna Erickson, Sean Mannion's grandmother. And as her grandson takes the field again, he could set the Pac-12's career passing mark on this drive. He needs 36 yards, and he's got Chris Brown as his tailback for the first time tonight. On play action, there's Victor Golden. First down catch before he's driven to the turf by Cam Walker in coverage. Mannion continuing to work his way towards the all-time passing yardage record in the Pac-12. As he's doing that, he's leading his team back from behind. Jordan Villeman caught his most recent touchdown toss. He's at the bottom of this formation. And here comes the fly sweep with Bolden. He's got Caleb Smith leading the way with the block, and he's inside the 30. A good gain on first down for Bolden and the Bees. Now, like Oregon State when they're in 12 personnel as they are right now, you've got one running back, two tight ends on the field, so it allows the versatility. You can still try to dominate the line of scrimmage, having those two tight ends in that wide, that inline sort of position, running the ball down, downhill, or you can start to split them out, get a guy in the slot, start to run them off in coverage with linebackers. You've got a lot of versatility, especially with the way this lineup is currently constructed. Two tight end sets. Quickly to the left side. Bolden breaks away from one. Stephen McClure finishes him off in the red zone. First down OSU. So the formation they use with that 12 personnel where you've got both tight ends as inline blockers in that position, essentially being that C gap, now it allows you to get one-on-one -on -one coverage. You can predicate that you'll be able to get talented athletes like Victor Bolden one-on-one -on -one with corners. And as you deliver the ball, as long as you have a good throw and catch, there should be space to operate. First down on the ground. Chris Brown, touchdown! Second score of the season for Chris Brown and his second in as many weeks. They told us Chris Brown is doing the little things better. Just the footwork there, 
freezes the linebackers for a moment. They see the shuffle and then the vision, the burst, as he works across the paint. Blocked so well at the point of attack. So the Beavers are back within a score. Trevor Romain. Makes it 27-24. For the Beavs cash in on great field position. They go four plays, 50 yards, and the 17-yard touch from Chris Brown. And kudos to Mike Riley and John Garrett. As we discussed earlier this quarter, there may have been a notion down 17 points to get away from who they are, how they operate best offensively. You know, that formula that they use against Colorado, where Mike Riley told us that's probably the best offensive performance, the most complete and most balanced that Oregon State has been all season. What they did against the Buffs just about a month ago, they stuck with that on this last drive in the last couple of series that they've been on the field, and that's gotten them back into this game. Don't abandon the run. Keep the tight ends in the lineup and on the field. That's Oregon State football. I'll take you back a little bit further when they got Cyril Nolan Lewis flying out of the secondary to get that sack on third down on Jared Goff. Finally, they get to the Cal quarterback, and I think that shifted the whole tide in their favor. Good field position, a score, and they're within three with 104 to go third quarter. Trey Watson from his five. And out to the 25-yard line. Anthony mentioned that Colorado model that Oregon State wants to use. I don't think I've ever had a coach say to us three times in a conversation, we want to be just like we were in one particular game. But Anthony, it was the only Pac-12 game they've won in their last nine tries, so this is not a bad blueprint to replicate. I was in the Pac-12 Network studios in the touchdown room with Rick Neuheisel, Curtis Conway, Mike Yammer. We're all watching that game play out between Oregon State and Colorado thinking this is who they need to be, and I certainly agree with Mike Riley. He seems to feel along the same lines as we did. Sweeping his last go and penetration on the perimeter from the Beavs with a flag down. For now, gives Strong the tackle for a loss. Illegal formation, five players in the backfield, five-yard penalty, first down. And so now the question is for the Cal offense, as we get to the latter stages of the third quarter, they're still leading this game right now, but momentum has most certainly shifted. And so what does Cal do to get momentum back? They're not a team who usually stays stubborn running the football, but formationally, can they continue to find Lasco creases? They motion him out of the backfield, and it's blown dead before it even starts. False start, number 66 of the offense. Five-yard penalty, second down. There's Reeser for the first time really tonight on defense. They have come alive. Corvallis, Oregon in full throat, supporting this defense. Final seconds of the third quarter as Edwin Bud Delva and that Beavs defensive line digs in. Again, Lasco motions out. And he got him on the swing pass, and he just went right through his hands. Third down and 16. This is down a distance that can be dangerous territory. It's a secondary and a linebacker core. It's known to make the big play. They've got sticky fingers. That's like Michael Doctor, DJ Alexander. You want to put the ball in the traffic if you don't have to. Bees show blitz and back off. Goff has time. It's tipped up and falls harmlessly to the turf. But Cal will have to punt in the final second of the third quarter. Give Ryan Murphy the key to flexion. So Murphy had zone eyes going the entire way. You see him 
as he gets out of his pedal. He's looking back at Jared Goff. Goff manipulates the pocket well. Great break from Murphy. This converts, works downhill. Second opportunity to get an interception and take it the other way for Ryan Murphy. Another one that went through his hands. OSU should once again get fantastic field position. Ramel Dockery lets it bounce, and that's going to cost him about 15 yards, maybe more. Oof. A tough one there for the Beavs on special teams, but they've got the football, and they are within three as we go to the fourth. Twenty three carries for one hundred and fifty one yards for Daniel Lasko in tonight's contest. Two of those going for touchdowns. They've been able to control him more so in the second half here, JB. But Banyan and the Beavers offense have come on as well. He begins this drive nine yards shy of Matt Barkley. They put it on the ground. Teron Ward burrows ahead for two. The penetration there by Tony McCarry. Knock him off his track. Second down and eight. See Victor Bolden splitting out to Mannion's right. Jordan Villeman, the receiver, down at the bottom of the screen. Two tight ends in formation as well. Mannion, time to throw. Misses Victor Bolden, but a flag flies late. Darius White, the junior corner, was there in coverage. Pass interference, number six of the defense. Spot foul, automatic first down. And they had multiple defensive players from the Bears. They could have thrown that same flag on Hardy Nickerson, was also holding. We're going to see Darius White. The ball ends up sailing out of bounds. It's, it's just it's too obvious. It's too apparent when you extend the hand away from your body, reaching out, grabbing on the outside of the shoulder. Ninth penalty of the night for Cal. Mannion play action, a deep drop. He puts it up top, and it's knocked away from Connor Hamlets. Michael Lowe, the fifth-year safety, punched it away. Broken up by Michael he tries Lowe. to fit it over the top to Hamlet. At six foot seven tight end. I think the trajectory maybe could have he got the ball out of his hands earlier, could have thrown more of a teardrop to try to get Second it into Hamlet as opposed to more of a line drive. Sets up second and ten, just underway, fourth quarter. Beeves trailed by as many as 17. An awful snap that Mannion gobbles up and nearly threw for a pick six. That had trouble written That's all over it. Mannion and Bees fortunate to survive it. it. Just never got in the air. I mean, that snap just dribbled along the ground. We've seen multiple plays here in the second half, but Sean Mannion has had to field the ball on the ground, one of his own doing, where the ball slipped out of his hands in the pocket. And center Josh Mitchell has been the one constant along this offensive line for Oregon State. Third down and long. As they come to the line again, Mannion needs nine to get past Matt Barkley. He needs the 47. And he has it. With that throw, Sean Mannion makes Pac-12 history. The league's all-time leading passer. A great read from Mannion. Only a three-man rush, so the pass protection extremely solid. Throws an absolute dart outside the numbers to counter Hamlet. As Hamlet runs wide open, it's one of those balls that can be viewed as a layup, but Mannion doesn't miss it, hits him right between the numbers. Hamlet secures the football, which will go to the OSU sideline and presumably into Mannion's trophy case eventually. Hunter Jarman on this play with a flag down ran a long way to get back to the line of scrimmage. Hunter Jarman around the right side. Flag down on the play. Michael Lowe running Jarman out of bounds. 
So nine penalties for Cal. If this is on OSU, it'll be their seventh. There was no foul in the play for defensive holding. Second down. And that will give us time to appreciate the mark that Sean Mannion has just set. And Mark Second Riley talked about his freshman year coming in to join this program and seeing not just a special level of productivity, but there's a reason that Sean Mannion's been a three-year captain for this program. The level of perseverance he's shown, the level of preparation that he puts in on a day-in, day-out basis. The first three-time captain in OSU history again to the near sideline. Victor Bolden with separation. Inside the 30. There's a different type of bounce to the Oregon State offense right now. The Beavers are feeling things on the football field at a different level right now. 19 yards on that pickup. The Beaver Dam is back into this one. A chance for OSU to tie or take the lead. Teron Ward probing that right side. He's got the corner. He's got the first down, and he's out of bounds. At the 16. Dustin Stanton getting the start at the right tackle. Wasn't long ago that he was a tight end. Outstanding job. Shielding off the defensive end, working up to the second level to get a second block on the linebacker. That sprung to Ron Ward. Ten catches, 116 yards for Bolden. He's at the bottom of your screen, but they'll put it on the ground with Ward again. He makes a man miss and piles into the end zone to give OSU the lead. Seven touchdown of the season for Wolf. You see the log block off the down block from Connor Hamlet. And as Fred Luina pulls around to Ron Ward, didn't want to be denied from the end zone. Ward's just built low to the ground. He's got four on the floor, 5'7", over 200 pounds. So we're going to take another look at this play to see whether or not his knee was down before he got across the end zone. It was very close. Just see the power that Teron Ward possesses. The football may just be just outside that white stripe. And again, they need the indisputable field. visual evidence to overturn a call like that. If it's not conclusive, the touchdown will stand. But how about the comeback from Oregon State? Not only did they trail going into the half, Anthony, but Cal tacked on on the Golden Bears' first offensive drive of the third quarter. You see the effort there. Stephon McClure was a great tackler more often than not. Ends. Touchdown to Oregon State. You hear him use the phrase stands as opposed to confirmed. Call on the field was a touchdown. They didn't see enough to overturn it. To Ron Ward leading the charge, leading the cheers with the crowd. Romain ready for another PAT. And Oregon State has its first lead since 7-3 back in the second quarter. Teron Ward from the 16. It's next right here on the Pac-12 Networks and also your Pac-12 Now app. It's been a long day for those guys in studio. Starting with an 11 o'clock kick. Somebody get Nick Aliotti a fresh cup of coffee. Don't let him fade after that big time Oregon Ducks win. Well, let's take a look back. I mean, we got Fred Luina here. We got Sean Harlow, two guys who are going to pull around off the block from the edge of Connor Hamlet. So this log where Hamlet blocks down the defensive line, you get two big uglies pulling out in space, and then Teron Ward goes to work on three different Bears defenders willing his way into the end zone. 
By the way, Fred Lawina making his first career start tonight for you circled there at left guard. They knew he's talented, but as Mike Riley put it, it's just a matter of getting the right guy, knowing his blocking assignments. Job well done there. Now Jared Goff with the football and a chance to answer. He's under pressure, and he goes down. That's my guy. Oh, boom goes kaboom. <laughs> You got to love a wide receiver willing to move to defensive end. And not only is he just there taking up space, leads the team in sacks this season. And he's only getting better. He's oh so close to picking up another sack, but then he notices at the end that Jared Goff got rid of the football. And he was outside the pocket, so it was not intentional grounding, only second and ten. Quickly now to the near sideline. Steven Anderson makes his seventh catch, and he's north of 70 yards on the Knights. Well, it's just an outstanding story with Watson, the guy who was in a position battle with Richard Mullaney last season at wide receiver, trying to be that other guy, that Robin to the Batman of Victor Bolden last season. They said, you know what? If you're not going to make it on that side, we'll take you on defense. Lasco bounces it outside. And he stopped about two yards short of that first down. You know, the other thing with Guachim, as he made the position change, they put him on the seafood diet. You see it, you eat it. <laughs> Sounds familiar. <laughs> as in, like, what we did this weekend <laughs> here in Corvallis? Well, instead of going trick-or-treating for candy, we just went out every restaurant we could find over the last couple of days and just ate up everything in sight. Thank you, Roxy Dogs and Seda. Last night in particular. Second and two. Lasco again. He's got the first down and he nearly had a whole bunch more. He is into Oregon State territory with a fresh set of downs. Well, the second half has certainly been quiet by comparison for Daniel Lasco with the numbers he put up. But he's got to make an imprint here in the fourth quarter. These Bears are going to take the lead and try to get their fifth victory of the season. Four wide for Goff. Lasco next to him now has 165 on the ground. He will not get a try on this play. It is incomplete. Pride outs. Tyreek Zimmerman able to get it away from Darius Powell. We saw there the fight towards the end. It's one thing to have sure hands, but a lot of these wide receivers from Cal have strong hands. As the ball comes in, Zimmerman on the first effort couldn't get it away from Powell, but then the second and third effort raking it away at the end. Back to the ground game. Vic and Wary. Got about half of what they needed. Third down and mid-range coming. Again, Tyreek Zimmerman involved in the play defensively for the Bees. They've still got in wary on the field. I'll be surprised if we don't see some version of a blitz here. So we've got the freshman in wary in the lineup where Daniel Lasco is better in helping in pass protection. Ten minute mark, fourth quarter. Goff pulls it out and keeps the drive alive. Steven Anderson, catch number eight. He didn't even make his season debut until the Arizona game and then broke out for a career day against CU. It's a very emotional video that Anderson posted online from last Christmas when he was finally awarded a scholarship for his Cal football program. He and his mom. And where he left side. Got through an arm tackle. And puts eight on first down. There's players who come in with physical ability, and a lot of times the fans are wondering, why don't they use this guy? Why aren't they featuring that player? But Vic and Weary is a guy who, as a freshman, the coach has talked about the strides that he's made, not just running the football, because he can do that immediately, but the finer points, the little things like pass protection, like when you don't have the football, how are you showing yourself to the defense to help others out? Goff to Maurice Harris. A lot of hand fighting, and of course, 
a penalty marker. Steven Nelson there going toe to toe. Pass interference. Number two of the defense. 15 yard penalty and an automatic first down. Well, one thing I'll say that's shifted throughout the game tonight is that early on, especially in the first quarter, they were allowing a lot of hand fighting and it was let go both ways. Now, as the game has progressed, they've really been throwing flags on some of the hand fighting as the ball's been in flight. But I guess the consistent part of them making that shift in the game is that they have flagged both teams for these passes down the field. Goff signals he's ready for the snap. Puts it in the gut of Inwery. Right into the heart of that defensive line. Not much there. The heaviest beaver, Ciala Hautau at 350. Was in on that tackle and now he has to come off because his lid popped off for one play. I'm guessing with a head his size, it's difficult enough to get the helmet on, let alone to have it pop off during a play. I speak from experience there. Goff doesn't mind seeing him leave for second and nine. Looking right, working through his progression, found Chris Harper in the back of the end zone. Cal back on the high side. There's a reason that Chris Harper was on the preseason Belitnikov watch list. He can make difficult grabs and watch the release here. You see him chatter his feet and then burst into the secondary away from Larry Scott. And Goff, as he delivers the ball, sees Harper made the catch. A little sudden salutation from the sophomore QB. Goff finally gets his turn through the air and a crucial answer midway through this fourth quarter. Bears by a field goal following a 10 yard, 75 point, 75 yard drive. And any other quarterback in the rich history of the Conference of Champions. Malcolm Marble from his five with his team down by three. He is in good field position out across the 30. You will surely recognize the names on this list. Connor Halliday in there at the number four spot. Interesting that he could have made a run deep in this season, except for the fact that his year is now likely over. As we understood, he underwent leg surgery tonight to start the repair process on that injury he suffered against USC. Very unfortunate news about Connor Halliday at Washington State. But big congratulations to Sean Mannion on an outstanding career that he's had as a passer. Two touchdown tosses for Sean Mannion tonight. He opens in an eye formation with Ricky Ortiz in front of Storm Woods. Nothing doing. And by the way, more yeah, records in Sean Mannion's sights. He needs two touchdowns to catch someone named John Elway on the Pac-12's career touchdown list. He needs three more to break Derek Anderson's OSU school record of 79. But right now, he's just concentrated on getting OSU back in the win column. Homecoming weekend in Corvallis. We hit the eight minute mark, fourth quarter. Play action. A single receiver read, it looked like. He got caught up and he threw it away, and that will prove costly. Caleb Coleman with the pick of his career. The former receiver switched to defense for more playing time, and he tilts this contest this one ill-advised from Mannion trying to get away from the rush knowing he's in trouble not able to get any steam on this football that he's attempting to throw away and Caleb Coleman continuing to get more and more comfortable on the defensive side of the football makes a huge play there for the Bears so Goff set up at the 26 with Lasco he's hit behind the line of scrimmage no gain on the play. DJ Alexander gets credit for the tackle. Justin Strong was in there from his safety spot as well. The surprising thing on the mechanics there from Sean Mannion is that he's a guy as well who's gotten comfortable just climbing into the pocket, working vertically. But there, he decided to try to run laterally, get outside. Sean Mannion's not a guy with the foot speed to outrun athletic defensive ends. 
to try and get around the corner and get out of trouble. Will it be a one score game or two when he gets the football back? Goff with a lot of traffic at his feet. That ball comes loose. It gets out of bounds, and I believe they'll say he was down. Jared Goff making a similar ill-advised decision to what we saw Sean Mannion do a moment ago. Take the sack, Jared Goff. You just saw the opposing quarterback give the football to your team, making a move similar to that. When you're in the grasp, don't make a bad play worse. That was, of course, Dylan Wynn setting up third and 14 for Cal. Huge moment in this contest, especially for the Oregon State defense, trying to cover up an interception from their quarterback. They bring pressure. Goff over the top of it. Incomplete. No penalty markers. They haven't been able to make Oregon State pay for one-on-one -on -one coverage situationally on the outside. The pass protection actually held up well there for Cal. Really thought they did a nice job in protection off the blitz. Gave Jared Goff time to look downfield and deliver the football. James Langford on. He already missed from just inside of 50. This a bit shorter, but it would still match his career long. He hit it well, and he hit it through. That's good. The senior kicker, James Langford, gives Cal a two-field goal lead. American Dream Pizza, they don't serve deep dish. Marble from his own goal line. He wants it. Across the 20, but not much more. So 6.07 to go as Sean Mannion, following the interception, gets the ball back, trailing 37-31. And a reminder that the Dr. Pepper postgame report is coming up next with all of the night's action, all of the day's action in Pac-12 football, a lot to sort out in the Pac-12 South. They'll also recap this game between Cal and OSU. Mike Yam and company in our San Francisco studios as soon as we're done here on the Pac-12 Network and on your Pac-12 Now app. Question is, will Curtis Conway still be awake once they get in the studio? That's the question. <laughs> His Trojans won a long time ago, it feels like. <laughs> Was that today? <laughs> Jordan Villeman, the target of that strike for Mannion. Cal trying to argue. You can see Sonny Dykes there that he juggled it on his way out of bounds. Well, lucky for them, Oregon State does huddle offensively, so there's no need for the slowing of the tempo as we saw Cal attempt to do when they had the ball on offense earlier in this contest. But I really think that Jordan Billiman is a future star for this program. He's already starting to become a star before our eyes. After a 21-yard pickup, they go straight down the line of scrimmage to Victor Bolden. He's spun down by Darius White. Give him four yards on first down. Darius White making the stop for Cal. Well, no Richard Mullaney. He's likely done for the year in this receiving court. Kellen Clute, the tight end, still working his way back. So Mannion has had to, well, teach these receivers to grow up in a hurry. 244 yards passing as they do just that tonight, including a couple of touchdown tosses. They've got second and six and untouched from the edge. Jonathan Johnson. Jonathan Johnson, bring it Jonathan Johnson came unblocked off the edge. Uh, you're speaking about layups for quarterback. Jonathan Johnson has the layup here on Sean Mannion. Make sure that he gets him wrapped up, brings him down. Only UCLA has allowed more sacks than Oregon State in the Pac-12, and we've seen how disruptive that's been to Brett Hundley and the Bruins offense. Likewise, here in Corvallis, puts him well behind the chains as well. Third and 16, Villeman again, using his hands beautifully. It's going to bring up a fourth and short. It's just on the opposite side of the 50. They're only down six, so I think there's enough time left in the game. 
I would punt it if I were Mike really? Riley. Wow. I, I would punt in this situation. Try to pin them down here and see if you can get the football back. I don't mind the aggressive play call. If I was making the call, I would punt this football. They've got a full two. Chris Brown switching sides. Again, it was Johnson blitzing. I don't know. A fantastic open field tackle, Caleb Coleman. And that spot looks short. We've seen Coleman making plays throughout this game. Another unblocked defensive end ball comes out quickly. And you see Coleman come in right there, securing the tackle, making sure that no additional inches are gained by Chris Brown. They do not even have to measure. It goes over to Cal inside of four minutes to go with a six-point lead. For me, situationally, because of where you're at with the field position, now you're just looking at, you know, two first downs at most before Cal is in field goal range, and now they can make this a two-score contest. That's why I would have played the football. Lasco on the ground, a stiff arm to Michael Doctor. And with that run, Cal has a new season high on the ground, breaking their previous mark of 255 against Sacramento State. Seven-yard pickup leaves second and three. OSU does have all three timeouts. Play clock's only at 15, and Goff would be wise to use all of it. We've seen Cal at different points throughout the season not manage the clock, not really let time drain properly. They've maybe learned from a few of those early mistakes. The Arizona game comes to mind. Here's the pitch to Lasco. Maybe one. Stays inbounds, more importantly, to force yes. OSU to make a decision. Without a doubt, you saw him make that spin move as he approached the sideline barrier. Spun back inbounds, not just trying to avoid Michael Doctor on the tackle, but trying to make sure he could stay inbounds and keep that clock running forcing Oregon State to take a timeout. Which they do. Third and two upcoming. And going back to that fourth down call from Mike Riley, the reason that I was getting to, into is I would have punted the football because of the field position here and then the fact that there was still over four minutes on the clock. And so if you're able to punt the football and pin them down, maybe not only inside the 20, I mean, Cole Leininger is an outstanding punter. Maybe you pin him inside the 10, you can tilt the field in your advantage in that case and still potentially get the football back with plenty of time remaining because you did have three timeouts. I mean, it, you know, all these calls, all these decisions that get made by coaches during games with good reason are under plenty of scrutiny. And that scenario could really go either way. I just felt like the way this game was playing out, I thought punting was the proper call. Goff to throw for it on third down, and he has it with Steven Anderson who's on his feet inside the 20. Ninth catch of the night for Steven Anderson, and it's his biggest. You love to see the emergence of any young football player, but when you've got a walk on, a guy who wasn't offered a scholarship by anyone, barely recruited by schools, even at the FCS level, wanting him to come join their programs with Steven Anderson, has just grown not only physically but mentally and emotionally with this ball club and Sonny Dykes the confidence that he has in this young wide receiver has grown with that back to Lasco working on a career high he's buried for a loss of two get a look at the Ander the numbers on Steven Anderson tonight averaging 13 yards per snap Nine receptions in the game, 117 yards. And we mentioned some of the targets that are out of the lineup for Cal, like Kenny Lawler, Trevor Davis. They needed to be able to lean on someone, and you anticipate going in that it's going to be Chris Harper. But Harper didn't do it by himself tonight. Steven Anderson has made huge plays throughout the game. And Goff does not have to think six here. Even a field goal would make it a two-possession game if they can drain the clock. Two timeouts left for the Beavs. The snap comes at three on the play clock. Lasco looking for the dagger. His third rushing touchdown of the night. The 
Any complete cake is going to be at its best with a little bit of icing, and I believe that's what we just saw from Daniel Lasko. Made a nice move in the backfield to evade a penetrating tackler, and then from there you see offensive linemen leaning on defensive linemen, bursting running backs like Daniel Lasko, putting the game away for the Bears. 30 carries, a career-high 188 yards, and his touchdown streak continues. Cal will use a timeout here. Leading by 12. That's too cold for that. They're probably thinking about two points here, Anthony, to make it a full two-touchdown lead. As they should be. Not sure what those students were thinking about being shirtless and such. It's a bit chilly for that, but but yes, Daniel Lasko, outstanding efforts by him tonight. And I, I do agree the math would dictate here and that the coaches have those cards in their pockets. The card would certainly dictate that this should be a situation where Cal would go for two to make it a 14-point game. He's digging the rally comp presence there with the Cal band in attendance here in Corvallis as well. And Goff is on the field to attempt this two-point conversion. Lasko will be there with him. Great traveling contingent up from Berkeley, California. Looking for Cal's first win in the state of Oregon. For the first time since 07. Goff rolling right, now throwing back left to Maurice Harris. There is a flag in the end zone for now, it's two. And make that Daniel Lasko, the back, sneaking to the weak side. So he does it all, rushing for three and maybe hauling in a two-point. Again, we await the penalty. There was a pass earlier in this half that slipped through the hands of Daniel Lasko. They could have moved the chains for the Cal offense. You don't normally see him dropping passes. That'll look at the outstanding hands that he does the have for a running back. Two-point try is good. In addition, there was a personal foul, hands to the face. There are 39 of the defense. This 15-yard penalty will carry over to the succeeding kickoff. So that's a lot to digest because it means it is a full two-touchdown lead for Lasko and Cal. It means OSU will give yardage on the kick and then need a score, an onside, and a score to keep it alive. It's not the spot that Jared Goff would have wanted to deliver the football to. Great adjustment. I mean, just a spectacular grab coming back towards the football, having to stop the momentum, evade a defender, and then after you actually get around his body, be able to extend yours to make the grab. Of course, it's a career-high three scores, Anthony. It's also the first Cal player with three rushing since Shane Vereen had three at Stanford in 2009. This is a rushing attack that only had 122 yards per game in 2013. How far have they come? This is a game that's had as many ebbs and flows as a theme park roller coaster. I mean, you've gone throughout the night, and each team has seemed to seize control at different points. And Cal has had more answers here in the second half. Cheerleaders had a better chance at that return than anyone on the OSU roster. After that personal foul, hands to the face. And so 139 with two timeouts left for the Pac-12's all-time leading passer. He not only needs six, he needs six quick. And 14 as quick as possible <laughs> with 139 remaining. This is going to have to be an Arena Football League sort of finish for Oregon State if they're going to work their way back into this contest. A very quick touchdown necessary, then an onside kick, and hope to get another quick score. Three consecutive losses coming into tonight's game for Cal. Manning with time to hit Villeman. It was bobbled, and Cedric Dozier raked it away. Bears, if they can get this win, would be closing in on their first bowl eligibility since 2011. They needed two to start the night. Mike Riley and Sean Mannion not done yet. Crazier things have happened in the Pac-12 this season. Like Hail Marys? 
It may come to that. Teron Ward dancing for the first down. They're going to need more chunk plays if it's going to come to that. First down yardage across the 35. Dump off the immediate routes. That won't get the job done. There needs to be urgency about getting the ball downfield in a hurry. Some chances are going to have to be taken. Perhaps they end in an interception. But you won't know unless you try to deliver it deep. They go to the sideline and too tall for Victor Bolden. Think about Dozier. some of the tight finishes that have taken place in games for Cal this season. Even back to the season opener against Northwestern, that was one on an interception. We go to that magnificent Hail Mary, or magnificent if you're an Arizona fan. Go to the Colorado game where they had the win off the fourth down stop. Washington State game, the records were broken. And it's just been time and time again that this Bears football club has shown the progress you need. I mean, just being in games late for Sonny Dykes' squad after the season that they endured last year. I mean, you know, on Twitter with Yogi Roth about it right now. I mean, the most improved team in the Pac-12 conference, this Cal Bears squad. And it's, it's not that they're the most improved in overall victories in the entire country. There were some playmakers here on the squad last year. And they're still young. They were young last year, but they're in the second year of the system. And now even defensively, having Art Kaufman in here as a defensive coordinator, he's still molding things on that side of the football. But you see situational improvement. You see strides being made at key positions, the defensive backfield, the linebacker position. I, I know Art Kaufman. I've seen his defense over the years. He'd like to get smaller. He'd like to get faster up front and have really athletic guys rush the quarterback as he's had at other stops he's made along the coaching way. But this is a team that's believed, and they've got captains like Daniel Lasko and leaders like Jared Goff who sit there and they've taken the punches and they've withstood a lot of blows over the last couple of seasons that haven't always ended in victories. And having a three-game losing streak coming in here against a team in Oregon State who had a lot on the line as well couldn't be more impressed with what we've seen from Cal tonight. Mannion has to have this on fourth and four, and their chances, albeit slim, are still alive in the Cal territory finally with 33 seconds remaining. First and 10, Bears 45. Cal has an open date next week before a trip to USC. They finish at USC, home to Stanford, and then a non conference finale against BYU. Mannion from the shotgun. Got to start taking some chances here. Incomplete for Teron Ward. OSU, as you mentioned, will have Washington State here next week, then ASU at Washington and the Civil War. Second down and 10. Bowl eligibility, if they do not pull off something miraculous, is still two victories away. This is a squad that can get it done. There's no doubt about it. There's enough ability for Oregon State to come up with a couple of wins there, but it's going to be tough sledding in the month of November. They've got some tough games to finish up with here. It has been a career night for Jordan Villeman after a great night against Utah in a breakout performance. He's done it again here. Ten seconds left. Also worth noting that Cal, with 45 points, has gone for 30-plus in four straight road games under Sonny Dykes. That is also a school record, and it appears that it will be enough tonight in Corvallis. Got to throw to the end zone. Mannion goes short to Ward. This will run out the clock. And Cal snaps a three-game losing streak. They win in the state of Oregon for the first time since 2007. And here in Corvallis for the first time since 06. Ones. It's the hallmark of a program that's growing in the proper direction. Cal's had some close victories. They've most certainly had some close defeats as well. But leaving this field with a win is yet another milestone 
one game away from bowl eligibility now for Sonny Dykes, his coaching staff, and this very young, extremely talented football squad. And Dre is with the head coach of the Bears. Thanks, JB. Coach, balanced offense through the air and on the ground tonight. What can you say about the way Jared Goff distributed the ball? Well, it wasn't always real pretty. We had some uh, some moments where, you know, we missed some open receivers, but uh, he did a heck of a job of uh, taking what they gave us. And, you know, we ran the football, and I think it's why we won the ball, the ball game tonight is because we ran the ball and we got some stops defensively when we needed to. What did you think about the way Daniel Lasco played and the way he's been playing over the last couple of games for he, this he team, rushing hard. the ball? Yeah, he plays hard. I mean, he's a tough kid. He plays hard. And, um, you know, he's one of our captains, just a, just one of those guys that you want to put the ball in his hands when the game's on the line. What did you think about the character your team showed to hold off this Oregon State surge, hang on to the game, and advance with a win tonight? Well, it was big for us to, to weather that storm and to be able to make some plays down the stretch and figure out a way to win the ball game. This is a good football team. You know, Oregon State's one of the best coached football teams in college football. Mike Riley's a class act, and I got a lot of respect for his program. All right, Coach, thanks a lot. Best of luck next week. Let's send it back upstairs to you guys. Thank you, Dre. And on a night where Sean Mannion becomes the Pac-12's all-time passing leader, Jared Goff, Daniel Lasco, and the Golden Bears steal the spotlight. A career-high 188 on the ground for Lasco and three touchdowns to lead the Golden Bears to victory. 45-31 the final for Anthony Heron on J.B. Long. Our producer has been Aaron Owens, our director Martin Tarr. That'll do it from Leaser Stadium in Corvallis. Let's go to the studio for the Dr. Pepper post-game show.